Japan, Nihon, the land of the rising sun, the birthplace of many things the world loves, including anime, um, VHSs, Tokusatsu Entertainment, Samurai, Toyota, Nissan, Mario, Sonic, Pokemon, PlayStation, and, in October 1964, a railway revolution. The Zero Series Shinkansen, the world's first modern high-speed train. The opening of the railway line this train served, the, the Takedo Shinkansen, marked the start of railways finally being able to compete with air travel. Konnichiwa, my dear subscribers. Welcome to my High Speed Trains livestream. High Speed Trains are, without question, my favourite type of modern train. Obviously, nothing beats steam trains, but... But High Speed Trains for me are a very close second. So I chose this stream to dedicate to High Speed Trains because in less than 48 hours time, I'm going to be traveling on them all across France to Port Aventura. And I'm very excited for that trip. So we're going to cover the entire history of High Speed Trains in this stream from the, um, from, from the Japanese Shinkansen to the French TGV. I don't know how many different high-speed trains we're going to cover in this, but at the very least we will cover the Shinkansen and the TGV. Okay, right, who have we got? Hello to Bash, Jupiter, The Gamer, Martin, Rob, John Murray, um, Stan, Stephen, uh, I said hi to John Murray already. Oh, and Spyro and Cinder as well. Oh, and Jacob. I think that's everyone. 16 people already? Oh, 18 people. That raid has done... That raid has done my, um, channel wonders. I don't like this, Anne, either. You don't love her. What do you mean? What did you mean so far all lies, Stan? Speedy austerities. Austerities are anything but speedy, Stan. Hello, William. Nice to see you after a few weeks. Yeah, I've been looking forward to seeing you. Behemoth Monkey, nice to see you, one of the people from the raids. Yeah, it's nice to see you again, William, after a few days. Now, hopefully, we should have some... We should have some of the usual people, you know, Odd, Victor, Charcoal, Electro, Neon, all those people. Yeah, thank you. Oh, sorry, Mason, I said hello to you. Top out at 200 miles an hour? No, no, Stan. 50 miles an hour, absolute best. Okay, so now that song has ended. Now, I hope you liked that Japanese music to start off the stream with, because you know, um, because you know, um, um, because you know, high-speed trains got their start in Japan. All right, Jacob. Hello, Banoffee Pie. Nice to see you. Okay, so we'll start off with this history video from Mustard about the um, Shinkansens, and then after that we'll, uh, and then after that we'll, um, we'll drive the Shinkansen on um, Roblox. Hello, uh, James. On annoying internet. Okay. Oh, annoying the internet. Yeah, should be a fun one. Getting into the Sly Cooper games. Nice. So yeah, we'll start with this video tonight. Top Gun 3. Lovely. Can't wait. Okay. 20 people already. Lovely stuff. But while this video plays, I want to hear from you guys. What are your favourite? Which high-speed train is your favourite? Let me know in the chat what your favourite high-speed train is while we watch this video. Acoustic covered. All right, right. Okay, let's do this. So this is how the train became competitive with air travel. Let's go. 
1964, Japan unveils the Shinkansen bullet train, and it has the Japanese glued to their televisions as news helicopters filming the. Well, not even the uh, TGV, um, Stan. So, so am I, Ace Smith. The Japanese glued to their televisions so am I, but as news helicopters filming the train struggle to me, keep up. Cheers nice erupt in living rooms across the nation. The Shinkansen is a powerful symbol of oh, Japan's post-war recovery. Okay. Uh, but it's also this is your favorite one. High-speed electric or diesel electric. All right. Good evening. Shinkansen you, is a powerful symbol of Japan's post-war recovery. But it's also groundbreaking because right. at the dawn the of the jet, whose helicopters filming the train struggle to keep up, cheers erupt in living rooms across the nation. The Shinkansen is a powerful symbol of Japan's post-war recovery, but it's also groundbreaking because at the dawn of the jet age, when air travel and cars seem yes, destined to replace to everything else, the lowly train is about to make a comeback. I don't know. I haven't really seen any A. Smith. In the 19th yeah, century, the things. locomotive and steamship replaced the horse and sailing ship as the primary movers of humanity. In the fast. 20th century, well, it me, seemed almost certain the as the primary movers of humanity. In the 20th century, it seemed almost certain that the automobile and aircraft were going to do the same, make earlier forms of transport largely irrelevant. Trains in particular were seen as obsolete, a slow and inconvenient way for people to travel. My ass no match are. for the unfettered freedom Hello, of the personal automobile. I know one in of them the is on display in York, and I've seen another one. I've seen a fair few of Japan's preserved trains at the Kyoto Railway Museum. Obsolete, a slow and inconvenient way for people to travel. No match for the unfettered freedom of the personal automobile. In the 1950s, the Americans were pouring billions into building interstate highways, and rail lines were shutting down. In Europe, railways were stagnating. Many countries were still operating steam locomotives. UK included. And it was in this context that Japan just was an blast on wheels. I think that may have been Jap the Japanese's intention when they designed it. What do you think of the Shinkansens, though, Stan? I know you said you're not a fan of Japan's trains, but what do you think of the Shinkansens, the classic Sing ones? Mountains, the classic zero drilling two. 67 oh, no mile thank you. locomotives. And it was in this context that Japan was blasting through mountains, drilling 67 miles of new tunnel and constructing over 3,000 new bridges, all to build a railway. Okay, but I, but, but you, but you. Alright, Stan. But this wasn't going to be just any railway. That's this was one of the too. most ambitious rail projects of the century. Yeah, it was. The Japanese were calling it the Shinkansen, and the trains on this new line would run at speeds unmatched anywhere in the world nearly twice as fast as any existing train in Japan. And the new line would be dedicated only to high-speed high trains, speed today, which meant they'd be able to travel really at incredible cool. speeds between Japan's two biggest cities, Tokyo to Osaka. And to make miles. such high speeds possible, the new line would be built using a wider gauge of rail. Oh, oh yeah, so most of Japan runs on three foot six inch, inch gauge tracks, but... Um, but uh, the Shinkansen lines are, are four foot eight and a half standard gauge. And it would be laid out with gentle curves, which meant Still tunneling there, through and bridging over much of Japan's difficult terrain. But for all its ambition, many dismissed the Shinkansen as ridiculous. A senior railway executive described the project in 1964 as the height of madness. Oh, the wider oh, gauge of rail, which was necessary for such high speeds, Japanese. made the Shinkansen Railway executive described the project in 1964 as the height of madness. The wider gauge of rail, mad. which was necessary for such high speeds, made the Shinkansen incompatible with the rest of Japan's rail network. 
Many questioned the value of a fast train if it would be stuck running on a single line, and whether the effort involved in getting trains to reliably go this fast was really worth it. But the criticisms weren't just technical. This was one enormously expensive project, and to make matters worse, over five years of construction, the Shinkansen's budget had spiraled out of control, nearly doubling over the original estimate. And because of that, two visionaries leading the project, the president of Japanese National Railways and his chief engineer, both resigned before the project even finished. The media were calling it Japan's Great Wall of China. So that is narrow gauge, the original mainline in Japan. Yeah, pretty much. Just even finished. The media were calling it Japan's Great Wall of China. A massive but ultimately misguided effort when other countries were looking towards jets and automobiles as the future. But the critics would soon fall silent. And rightfully so. There it is. What a beauty. When the first Shinkansen line opened in the fall of 1964, the world took note. Because it made cars on expressways look like they were standing still, and once profitable inner city air routes were now being threatened by a train. No, they're not. They never were, Stan. Once profitable People were arrogant cars on expressways that. looked like they were standing still, and once profitable inner city air routes were now being threatened by a train. In just the first three years of service, the Shinkansen carried over 100 million passengers, and demand skyrocketed. The new line not only better connected Japan's two largest cities, exactly, it seemingly William. pulled them closer together. Have you seen modern the Tokyo train executive now? Well, yeah, for some things I do agree, like the um, like the class, like the class 800s. No, they're not. But, but yeah, some modern trains are brilliant, though. In just the first three years of service, the no, Shinkansen sad. carried over 100 million passengers, and demand skyrocketed. The new line not only... Okay, I'll give it that transcontinental travel is... Um, I'll give it that transcontinental travel... You still only really... I'll give it that transcontinental travel, um, oh god, I'll give it that transcontinental travel is, um, is still viable with, um, transcontinental travel is still, um, that planes are still the best way to travel transcontinentally, but within continents, like within, especially within Europe, high speed trains are still the best. In just the first three years of service, the Shinkansen carried over 100 million passengers.
Okay, we're back. George, we're back now. Oh my god. So did I, but I think it's like, because Mustard's a big company that it is copyright protected. You did. Right! So, if we can't watch that documentary, despite how interesting it is... Uh, excuse me. Okay, so if, um, okay, so if we can't watch that, I guess we'll go on to Terminal Railways and drive the Shinkansen. It's been a long time since I've played this. Still no Victor yet, thought he'd have joined us by now. I know, uh, James. Hopefully the documentary I'm going to watch at the end of the stream isn't copyright protected. Come on, load. Right, so let's spawn the Zero Series Shinkansen. I've upgraded, um, I've upgraded it in this game to run at 280 kilometers an hour, as opposed to its usual 220 kilometers an hour. When it was being tested in 1963, it maxed out at 256 or 162 miles an hour. But I reckon, reckon it could have gone a lot faster. I reckon it could have done 280. Okay. Right, I think, I think when Odd shows up, we'll, um, I think when Odd shows up, oh, it's a bit loud. I think when Odd shows up, we'll, <laughs> turn this down, uh, we'll, we'll move on to talking about the TGVs. Robber train, he had locomotives. Oh, for goodness. We are. You still there, Stan? Alright, loading now. Yeah, point is though, with the dawn of the Shin the point is though, with the dawn of the Shinkansen, trains finally became competitive with air travel. There was also, but there was also a major design flaw with the Shinkansens. But I'll go into that towards the end of the stream. I 
think my favourite of the Japanese Shinkansens would have to be the 500 series Shinkansen. This beauty right here, yeah, this is my probably my favourite of the Shinkansens. We may drive this a bit later. You have to make a hollow out their heads. Well, within within domestically and within Europe, trains can compete with um, and. Ah, shit. You hate these? Why do you hate the 500 series, um, Stan? You told me you hate any train that looks too modern. Not now, Jacob. If it's not related to high-speed trains... If it's not related to high-speed trains, Jacob, then I'm not interested. This isn't the right stream to be showing that if it's not high-speed trains. Quicker to fly across Europe? Yeah, but it's... Far more tedious. The process is far more tedious. And I'll get into that when Odd shows up. Looks too modern. And I really like it. But I take it you also hate the E5 series trains, uh, Stan. Trains will never be able to cross oceans. Yeah, they will. I reckon that a railway going north over Greenland to America would be one day possible. I beg to differ, Stan. I've had too many issues with um, air travel in the past. <clears throat> you despise the E5 series. I can, I get why. It's their duck, you're definitely put off by their duck bill noses, aren't they? I quite like them, though. But for me, the 500 series is my favourite of the Shinkansens. Yeah, um... Yeah, unfortunately, some countries... While countries like here in the UK and America don't have very good high-speed rail, some countries aren't lucky enough to have any high-speed rail at all. Countries like Canada, Ireland, and even Australia doesn't have high-speed trains. Lego City made a few high-speed trains? I know. Sheila is one of them. Sheila is based on the Korean high-speed trains, I've decided. So you hate the E5s more than... Yeah, I know what you mean, Stan. So you hate the E5s more than the 500 series, Stan. I know, James. Yeah, but William, William, I reckon, I reckon high, I reckon, I reckon high-speed trains would work really well in Australia. Ten times more. Exactly, William. Alright, cool. Hey, Smith. Hello, Neil. Welcome to the stream. A plane without wings. That's exactly what... That's exactly what Stan said earlier. That's exactly how Stan refers to the Zero Series Shinkansen. Yellen's high-speed trains, the Yacht trains, the first... The first series of Yellen's high-speed trains were actually based on the Shinkansens. I know. Yeah, that's exactly what Stan said, Neon. By the way, Electro should be joining us fairly soon. He said he's bathing at the moment, but he'll be with us soon. 
Oh god, I've over. I've. Oh my god, I've majorly overshot the station. We've got to go back. Bit sus with no overhead lines, I know. <laughs> you, but yeah, you took the words right out of Stan's mouth, Neon. Though, Neon, as I just mentioned to everyone else, just been bathing, alright. As I just mentioned to everyone else, the, um, the Zero Series Shinkansen isn't my favourite Japanese high-speed train. The 500 Series is my favourite. I just love how it looks completely sleek. Would have been here earlier? I know, I know. Trains are mostly better. I've been on the Shinkansens myself. I agree, Neon, it does. But that was... That was only once, and this is the one I went on. The 700 series Shinkansen. These ones are, um... These ones, these ones are the most common types of bullet train in Japan today. Thank you, Summer Rose. Yeah, my trip is just, is in, um, my trip is in, uh, set off in about just over 36 hours. I'll rock 2049. I have, Stan. I went to Japan in 2018. Almost exactly six years ago. I think, in fact, I think it was pretty much exactly six years ago I was in Japan. And I did, and I have been on the bullet train. I went from Osaka to Tokyo. I have been on the original Takedo Shinkansen line, the whole route. Hello, MLP fan. Slightly intimidating. What, the 500 series, Neon? Curse of the Were Rabbit. Oh, cool. There is a problem, though. There's a lot of... Railway lines that go across Australia in the desert. Electric trains aren't really practical. I get that. Yeah, there's not many power stations in the outback. But like a high-speed line from Melbourne, to, from Adelaide or Melbourne up to Brisbane, for example, along Australia's east coast, I can see that being possible. Well, ML, well, not everywhere, Stan. I haven't been to Eastern... I haven't really been to Eastern Europe, Stan. I haven't really been to countries like Poland or the Czech Republic, but that could change next year. And I haven't been to the West Coast of America either, only the East Coast. So not really everywhere, Stan. Yeah, they are. The one you were just looking at? All right. I know. That could work. But yeah, one's like right across, um, but yeah, one's right across, um, now that, yeah, now that you mention it, with there not being much electricity in the outback, yeah, I get why you don't think, um, a high-speed line across the outback would work, William. Florida and the Mediterranean Islands? All right. You'll get to go to many other places one day. America is sort of getting there. America currently only have one high-speed train, the Acela Express, and that only tops out at 150, which is, which for high-speed trains is pathetic. Yeah, I already said hello to you, MLP fan. Been to no sludge location? I know. But yeah, I have been to Japan once. I, I will go back one day, though, not only to ride the other Shinkansen lines, but also to go to their theme parks. Nagashima Spa Land and Fuji Q Highland in particular. I guess I'm happy enough. Well, that, I guess that's all that matters, Neon. Anyway, uh, let's have a quick look at a map of Australia and see... and see where a potential high-speed line could go if it can't go across the outback.
Yeah, I reckon it could start in Adelaide and then do go to Melbourne, Sydney, up to Brisbane. And then, oh, there aren't many um, big towns north of Brisbane. So, yeah, Brisbane to Adelaide, I think, is the best. Brisbane to Adelaide, I think, is the best option for an Australian high-speed railway line. Via Melbourne, Canberra and Sydney. But yeah, across South Australia, all the way to Western Australia, to Perth, it might, yeah, that might be a bit much. Queensland. Yeah, Adelaide to Brisbane via Melbourne, Canberra and Sydney, I think would be best for a potential Australian high-speed railway line. Uh, what is, uh, what is James? What's this? <laughs> That's hilarious. A Japanese commuter train painted in Thomas colours. Now living in Ireland? Oh, cool. Still there, Stan? Or oh, why is that, Paul? Oh, still no Victor yet. I thought he would have joined us by now. Yeah, William, if you're still there, there you have it. That is the best route for a potential high-speed railway in Australia, I feel. Let's load the passengers. Oh, lovely, uh, uh, Stephen. Okay, you open my second cider now. Stan, are you still there or have you become distracted? And are you still there, Neon? Okay, let's wait. Okay, let's go. Oh, great. I'm on my first... Oh, you're on your first cider. Oh. Uh, and you are still there. I just left to get something. Oh, um, so was it a drink or something? Not yet, Stephen, but I'd love to go. Just getting something? All right. Well, I was just showing everyone where a potential Australian high-speed railway could go. Rail. Australian. Fuck. Sorry. <laughs> right then. Uh, where to? Uh, which way shall we go? Uh, we'll head towards Roslyn. A lot of people going to Roslyn South, so we'll head that way. <sighs> right. Oh, it's not mine, it's, um, it's in the game.
Wee -aw. I don't think the speed limit should be 100 kilometers an hour on here. It's too flat and straight. You should be allowed to go at higher speeds along here. Still there, Neon? Just beak borrowing. What does that mean? Cutting costs with no interior. <laughs> no interior. Roslyn Airport and wait <laughs> yes but a train is useless if it can't carry people or goods anyway oh yeah um uh, means picking my nose all right hello Sonic Frontiers welcome were you part of the raid last week Okay, so there's also the 100 series Shinkansen. Oh, well, uh, Robert from Red Cliff Railway Tales. A little bit of history. Robert from Red Cliff Railway Tales. Oh, hello, Jacob. So as I was saying, Robert from Red Cliff Railway Tales. Okay, bye, Jacob. Robert from Red Cliff Railway Tales is at, was actually originally built in Japan in 1968 as an experimental Shinkansen called the 50 series. Like a dog. Come on, Shinkansen. I'll, I'll have to have a look at that in a moment. But yeah, he was originally built as an experimental Shinkansen called the 50 series before being bought by the Western and Central Railway and shipped to England. When the Western and Central Railway closed, he was shipped to Germany before being rebuilt into an ICE-3 design. He is Stan, but he was originally built in Japan in 1968 as an experimental high-speed train, which became the base, which later, which decades later became the basis for, which decades later became the basis for Germany's ICE-3. Yeah, he was rebuilt into an ICE-3 later on. Oh, there's a Talis train coming. For those who don't know, Talis is now actually owned by Eurostar and is now under the Eurostar brand. Two, oh yeah, two, um, two ICE-2s joined Amtrak, and they serve the basis for the Acela Express. Uh, uh, the Kamon Shinkansen. So yeah, there's the 100 series. Doesn't look too similar to the 200 series, to the 0 series, only it's a bit pointier. I'll let you guys decide which is your favourite Shinkansen. So yeah, similar. So the 100 series is similar to the zero series, only more pointy. 200 series, very similar in design to the 100, but a bit more round. This is actually what Yellen's Yellen's first high-speed trains. Oh, I remember you, Peyton Richard. You like the 100 series best. Yeah, great. Yeah, I get that. So yeah, the 200 series was actually... Was actually the original Infinity series. The 200 series was... Uh, was, um... Was the basis for Yellen's first high-speed train. For, for the first... 
the original generation of Yellen's Yacht Trains, their high-speed train. Uh, 300 series Shinkansen. And then there's the 300 series. With this much, with, with a much more sloping face. Instead of a point, a sloping nose instead of a pointed nose. Is there a 400 series? Oh, yep. Yeah. And here we have the 400 series. Which looks like a much more traditional high-speed train. East Japan Railways. Alright then, uh... He's gone, Martin. Alright then, uh, James. Trains have been running the railways for as long as it existed. I, yeah, I, I get that. I think you've told us. The 500 series, these are my personal favourites, as we've already established. I don't think the 600 series exists. The closest... The E1 series was originally intended to be classified 600 series. So yeah, the E, the E1 and the E4 series are both um, double-decker Shinkansens. I know, Stan. But these were withdrawn from service in 2021. Only one vehicle is preserved. Then we have the 700. About the 800 series. Alright then, James. Yeah, this is the 800 series. Introduced in 2004. And what about the 900 series? Well, this was just an experimental one. E4 series looks awful. Right. Yeah, like the E5 series. The Caddy Series 5000 looks hot. I'll have a look at that. Okay, 1000 series. Oh, it's more the Class 1000. Oh, this was a test one. So then we've also got the E2s. Not to be confused with the E with the Brighton E2s. E3s. These look great. We've already seen the E4s and E5s. The E6s. And these look nice. E7s. And I think the E8s are the newest. Are the newest ones. Yeah, the E8s are the newest ones, I believe. See, 2024 to, pres to present... Oh, these, they, they only, oh, the E, the E, the E8s only entered service just two weeks ago. The E9 is a planned series. Uh, Nakati series 50,000. Let's have a look at this. Yeah, not bad. Uh, you... You probably hate this look, don't you, Stan? <laughs> I imagine you'd absolutely hate this look. A dome at the front like that. With a Shinkansen-style body. Oh, that would be awesome, Jacob. I, I reckon that would be awesome. Yes, Neon. <laughs> Oh yeah, we were gonna look at the Kamon Shinkansen. Hello, Wardley. Were you from the raid? Were you from the raid? Certainly not trying to piss Stan off. I have no idea who they are, who she is, uh, A Smith. That is worse than daylight. You think this is the worst train ever built, then, Stan? The ugliest train ever. I get that, but it looks it looks 
all right. Kana. Oh, that's interesting, Stephen. High spec at least. Nice. Uh, from her was Bolt. Oh, it is the worst train ever built. <laughs> okay, then. What, the film Bolt? Warning screen, Toy Story thing. All right. I knew you'd hate this design, um, Stan. Okay, uh, so, Neo, so the Kimon Shinkansen. You still there, William? Right, the Kimon Shinkansen. Should be nicknamed Stiggs. <laughs> I, oh, I see why, Jacob. I see why. It's because it looks like the Stiggs helmet, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah, the Kimon Shinkansen. Oh, these are one of the newest Shinkansens. I was thinking, what was that other new one? And this is it. Started operation in 2022. To get the taste out of my mouth. All right. Shaped like a knight's helmet. <laughs> well, well, Jacob thought it looked like the Stig's helmet. Uh, not really, Summer Rose. Hello, Wardley. See, that also looks a bit like a nose, I guess. Just the actual movies. Okay. Right, onwards. Onwards with the Zero series. Sorry, I shouldn't be making those noises. It's it's a bit racist. <laughs> How many viewers are we on now? 90 in less than an hour. Not bad. I have no, um, uh, I don't know, um, Neo, you'd have to ask the Japanese. I don't, I think, I think Zero Series was just these trains retroactive classification. Because, um, they were given that classification after they entered service because, um, they were simply known as the Shinkansens when they first entered service in 1964. <laughs> I'm sorry, Stan. Animated movies over live action movies. I get that. Pokemon train, which is adorable. Pikachu themed. Was it a uh, a commuter train or a Shinkansen? Oh, yeah. oh. I shouldn't say it. Okay. Um, guys, I also think that... Uh, 19, no, 1964, Neon. October 1964. Oh, a diesel commuter. Guys, I also think that high-speed trains in general... I, I think... That I personally feel that high-speed trains in general... Not just, like, fast steam trains, but high-speed trains in general... I think they all work pretty well with Gordon's theme from Thomas. Hence why I often use it in my uh, videos where I'm on intercity or high-speed trains. So I want to know if you guys agree with me. So let's get this Shinkansen up to speed and then I'll put Gordon's theme on. Same year. Exactly. That's part of the reason they uh, built... That's part of the reason they um, they built the Shinkansen. And this one. Yeah, I want to know... If I want to know if you guys agree that the Shinkan... That high-speed train... That Gordon's theme works well for modern high-speed trains. Because I think it does. No, I don't, Stan. Do you, so, do you guys think this works for high-speed trains, modern ones? I think it works better on steam engines. Yeah, I guess, but... The 
the gracefulness and the speed are still present is that's made well with this scene. The gracefulness and the speed that's part of Gordon's theme is what I think makes it work for modern high-speed trains as well. Oh, whatever. Exactly, Neon. High-speed trains are without question my favourite modern train. Obviously, nothing beats steam trains. But for me, high-speed trains are a close second when it comes to my favourite kinds of train. I said that earlier, Neon. Speed is everything. Single beat is song you recommended. Oh, it's unique. Rise the slowing down. Yeah, it is for Hina Funky. works better on speed. When it comes to retirement advice, the last thing you want is to be put in a bucket. Okay, no problem, Same as William. this Thanks type of person. See you next week. that type of person. At Fisher Investments UK, Jezza, yes. we never Power! put in a bucket. We always tailor retirement advice that's just right for you. Fisher Investments UK. Retirement advice that's as individual as you are. Learn more at fisherinvestments.co.uk. Investing involves the risk of loss. Fisher Passing down the countryside. By the if you say so, uh, Stan. Oh, oh dear. I've never been on a train in your 34. Whatever. Not even during your childhood. Gosh. Even some... Even some of the people who I know aren't train fans. Even some of the people who I know aren't train fans. Like Odd and Victor, they've been on a few trains. And in terms of looks, they're all right, but... The Azumas are all right, but... Seven and nine, cool. In terms of... In, ter in terms of looks, they're all right, but overall, the Azumas will never beat the HSTs and the Intercity 225s. Maybe you did and you don't remember? I think that's likely, Behemoth Monkey. Oh, you love seeing trains. Oh, great. But yeah, overall, I... Yes, as Stan said, Gordon's theme does work better for fast steam trains, but I feel... But I feel it works almost as well for um, for modern high-speed trains as well. The, the, the beat of Gordon's theme, the, the fast rhythm of Gordon's theme combined with its gracefulness, which were two things that can be associated with high-speed trains, is definitely what I think makes it work. Of course, Stan, of course. Okay, um, so we were going to talk about um, the TGVs when Odd, when Odd arrives. So I think for now... Suit to the Flying Kipper. Yeah, Thomas Music. Well, 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 the, well, the mail train theme works better for any night, it works well for any night train, uh, Neon. Okay, so I think now we'll, um... So I think now, um... Let's drive the Talis PBKA train. Let's drive the Talis train. These are, these are similar to the TGVs, but operated by a different company. We'll talk about the actual TGVs themselves. When Odd arrives. So yeah, these are based on the TGB POS trains. Yeah, these are based on the TGB POS trains. But they have, like, extra additional systems which allow them... They have, like, additional electrical systems which allow them to run... Into Belgium, Amsterdam, uh, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Germany. You do indeed, Neon. As I said, hopefully Electro will be joining us soon. 
Will Odd be interested in TGV? Well, he's, um, well, he's, he seemed to be mildly interested with train topics on this stream in the past, despite not being a train enthusiast, so, maybe. The main thing I want to know from him and Victor tonight is... The main thing I want to do with Odd and Victor tonight is convince them that high-speed trains are better for getting across mainland Europe, that high-speed high trains are better for getting across Europe in general than flying. Um... I don't know, but I think so, Neon. Obviously, they didn't do their research. Obviously, it would have been actual Eurostar trains in real life. A very optimistic man. <laughs> that's that's me, Stan. That's just me. Okay, so the Talis PBKA, that's what we'll drive now. Sort of came to mind. Don't worry about it. I understand. I thought Victor at least would be here by now. Still a struggle? I understand, Neon. It's still there, James. I don't think James has chatted for a while. James Lister. Here we go, get out up to 300 kilometers an hour. I have been on Talis before, once to Cologne and once, once in each direction to Cologne from Brussels and once in each direction to Amsterdam from Brussels. Last time I went to Cologne was when I went to Phantasialand, but that was, um, that was on a German ice train, not a Talis train. Yeah, I still refer to the services, to the Talis services now owned by Eurostar as Talis, because, so as to not get confused with the original Eurostar services to Paris and Brussels. But yeah, Eurostar also run limited services to, um, Eurostar also run limited services to, um, Marne la Vallée for Disneyland, as well as Amsterdam, as well as seasonal services to Avignon in the summer, and the Alps in winter. So many times in my life where I've been so close to visiting Belgium, but just haven't. Why Belgium of all countries, um, Stan? Might have an allergic reaction. Oh dear. <laughs> it's not an allergic reaction to the Talus train. Okay. So so I reckon I should I should actually talk about my high speed my actual high speed train journey on Sunday and Monday. Yeah, I reckon I should actually because you know, um, that's why I wanted to do this stream, because I'm doing a high-speed train journey in less than 40 hours. So, so first I'm heading to London to pick up the Eurostar. I would pick up the Eurostar from Ebbsfleet, but they're not currently stopping at Ebbsfleet. So, picking up the Eurostar from London to Pancras. And, I'm, and then I'm getting the 11.04 to Brussels. But I'm getting, but I'm, but I'm getting off at Lyon and changing, uh, no, Lille. I'm getting off at Lille, Europe and changing onto a TGV for Lyon Part Deux via Charles de Gaulle Airport and Marne Valley. It'll be my first time on the TGV Interconnexion line. The line, the, the high-speed line that travels east of Paris between LGV Nord and LGV Sud-Est. And it's also going to be my first time in Lyon, in the actual city of Lyon. Yeah, I've never been to Lyon, but that's going to change on Sunday. You can get a direct TGV from Paris to Barcelona. Friend, friend as well, okay. There's 
There is one of the TGB I've been interested on ever since all about fast trains video. SNC SNCF TGB Sudest. Oh yeah, those yeah, those are great ones. V tests from Red Cliff Rally Tales, as many of you know, is a TGB Sudest. But yeah, as I was saying, you can get a direct um, TGB from Paris to Barcelona, which runs twice a day in each direction. But um, me and my mum have done that route a, a, li a little bit too much as of recent. So we wanted a bit of a change this year, which is why this year we're going via Lyon. And then Renfe have recently started a direct train service from Renfe, the Spanish uh, national railway operator, started a direct train service from Lyon to Barcelona. So that's, so we'll be getting that on Monday after spending Monday morning in Lyon. So yeah, after spending Monday morning in Lyon, looking around Lyon, we're gonna get the eight, we're gonna get a Spanish AVE train from Lyon to Barcelona before changing onto before changing onto a regional um, Renfe service for the rest of the journey to Port Aventura. And yeah, that's the high speed train journey I'm going to be doing on Sunday and Monday. To add overhead wires? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it is a bit complicated to add overhead wires here. They just couldn't be bothered to update it. You still there, Stan? Um, no, I haven't really. Um, Ace Mail. Oh, fuck. All the times I've nearly been to France, my train, I've been to see the World War One. Oh, nice, Stan. Time of day going fast. Yes, it is. <laughs> On this game. Oh, 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 sorry, James. I asked if you were still there, but you said you needed to go to Shrek Swamp. I'm sorry. I never got to go because time's out to cancel because of stuff coming up. Like what? ITV audio described. Shrek Swamp is up for rent. <laughs> oh, random family stuff. Okay. Well, I'm sorry you've been denied your trips to France and Belgium. I've been denied my 2020 trip to uh, uh, Cedar Point. But oh well. At least I've been to Port Aventura. <laughs> Don't worry, Neon. It's it's funny, and that's what matters. We love funniness on these live streams. Funniness is always appreciated. Funniness, regardless of how random it is, is always appreciated on these live streams. <coughs> Complications? What is it to do with health and stuff? Oh, and uh, if some of you guys are wondering why um, why the TGV and such have have bogies, why the bogies are shared by each coach, why they have bogies that look like this that, that are between the coaches instead of one bogey on each end. Um, that will be answered. In the documentary I'm, I'm planning to show towards the end of the stream. Travel aspects affect me. I, I totally get it. 
flying is a complete nightmare for me. Yeah, that can sometimes happen in this game. The train randomly derailing. <laughs> oh my god. Hilarious. Safer than rail? I know, but still. I still prefer to travel by train. Between the coaches? Uh, no. No, Neon. It... All, no, Neon, all will be explained, um, all will be explained towards the end of the stream. Bad enough with coach trips, alright. What do you mean you're grounded, Neon? What do you mean you're grounded? Hello, Rob, oh, hey, Rob. What do you mean you're grounded, Neon? Uh. Alright, Rob. I don't really care about football and such. Oh, you're not in the air. Oh, you prefer not to fly. Oh, I see. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, well, I don't really feel like playing Roblox for the time being. Martin, he's already explained. Just give him some swag. Okay, Neon, okay. Uh, sorry, I mean MLP fan. Oh, don't worry, Neon. Don't worry. Right, guys. I need the toilet now, so... I'll be back. I well behaved. Of course you are. Of course I imagine you are. And why would you be grounded at your age? What? You might go for my channel again? Alright. Oh, it starts at 9 o'clock. Alright. Of a deadly high-speed train crash that happened in Spain. Oh yeah, that did happen with a high-speed train. Alright. Alright. On the ground. Oh, yeah, I know, Neon. Yeah, that was a high-speed train disaster that happened in Spain. Me and my family were on holiday in Portugal when it happened. Right, I'm, I gotta... <laughs> throw my... Uh, unicorn game on Roblox? Oh, cool. I have no idea, Paul Jones. Right, just gonna run to the loo again. Oh, 21 people, lovely. Let's see, uh... 117 views, nice. 170 view, 117 views in 70 minutes. Cool. Right, I'm just going to run to the loo again. Well, wait, I haven't been to the loo yet in this stream. I'm going to run to the loo and go uh, get some water. 2013, Neon. But yeah, it happened because the driver was speeding, which is completely disgraceful. We may actually have a look at that before... When I come back, as it is related to high-speed trains, it was a high-speed train that crashed. Hello, Davin. Nice to see you. Okay, so I'm going to run to the loo. And get some water. Uh, if anyone comes while I'm gone, you know the drill, guys. Tell them I've died in a tornado. Why well, you put a water... Oh, yeah, behemoth monkey, because I'm getting water. Yeah, over ten years ago. God, I feel old. Right, so I'll be back. And you know the drill if... Oh, hey again, George. 
only does streamers who are doing gameplay mainly. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. It could, it could still happen. Stay could still raid the stream again. Raid this stream again. Right. So am I, A. Smith. Right. So I'm just going to the loo. Wouldn't dare come when I'm here, George. He didn't when he didn't last week, um, Stan. Welcome back, Jacob. Right, I must go to the loo now. If anyone comes while I'm gone, you know the drill. Tell them I've died in a tornado. I'll be back. Okay, I'm back. What's been happening in the chats? <laughs> kind of lost motivation. Scared of the sheer size of my muscles. Might as well do a stream so you can come for me. Lightning doesn't strike twice. It does, sometimes. Too old for Jonathan, all right. Lost my... Used to lift weights. Okay. Okay, so I guess now, as, uh, who brought it up again? As, uh, Stephen brought it up. I guess as Stephen brought it up, we'll look at that Spanish high-speed train crash now. Oh yeah, this now infamous... CCTV footage of the crash, probably fighting off Mr. Tickle. Yeah, it tipped over, and then it smashes into the heist, into the security camera, and just destroys it. Thanks, Behemoth Monkey. So yeah, it tips over due to the centrifugal force. Knocks down the, knocks down the pylons, and then. And then, um, and then destroys the camera. Hello, Whopper guy. I take it you were from the, um, braid as well. Were you alternating? Yes. Trapping. I was all on fire and stuff. Very saddening. It was like a Talgo, um... It was it was a tight it was a Talgo high speed set that crashed. It was. Did you not hear about it, Stan? It was all over the news when it happened. Oh, you've seen it before. Hope nobody died. Uh, unfortunately, people did die. Uh, what was the I just what was the death toll again? I think it was a pretty bad crash. Santa Cargo de Compulsa Derailment, July 24th, 2013. 218 people were on board. 79 people died and 
143 were injured. 79 deaths. Jesus. He wasn't watching the news. Oh, all right. 79 deaths. Jesus. Yeah, the driver was going too fast. It was travelling at 100 miles an hour when the speed limit was 50. Spain's worst rail accident in over 40 years. Charged with 79 counts of homicide by professional recklessness. For overturning. You were only five. Yeah, I know. Twelve foreigners were dead as well. Two drivers were injured but survived. Spanish journalist Henry Bocata Lopez. Oh no. You were in sick four months, oh dear. Nationwide review of all railway lines. And the British is a dead or injury to one and one's an accident. Train on the same line was received with applauses. Well, that's cute. Driver was speaking on the telephone to staff about the route to Farol and consulting a map or document. Ah, uh, he was he was distracted with that. Talking on the phone, talking to central control. <sighs> idiot. What an idiot that guy was. I know. But of course, the worst high-speed train disaster in history was the infamous Ishede derailment, which happened with an ICE-2. So it was a Renfei Class 750 that was involved in the crash. This beauty right here. Uh. Dual gauge. Oh yeah, the Spanish high-speed trains have a unique feature where they can actually change gauges from four foot eight and a half standard gauge to to five foot five inch to five foot six inch Iberian gauge. Very high speeds. There's no room for error. Exactly. So what now? Oh yeah, we were going to talk about the Ashede derailment. So this is what happened at Ashede. Still there? Uh, oh, oh, you are still there, Stan. Can afford to play on their phones, our commuter train driver. Yes, I know, because they're so delayed. So yeah, what happened with the with the infamous Ashed uh, high speed train derailment was a wheel rim, a wheel rim that wasn't being properly inspected with ultrasound and stuff. A wheel rim that wasn't being properly inspected broke off. And it 
and the rim and the rim um and the rim pulled up a guide rail which caused the bogey of the affected coach to derail instead of points and then when it went over the points it knocked said points oh, what's your new name cbb's fan and then when i what was your original name and then when it went over the points it um when the derailed bogey went over the points, it changed them, causing the it, it caused the force caused those points to change, causing the coaches to fly off the tracks and knock a bridge down immediately before the bridge and make an extraordinary finding. There's evidence to suggest that after the points, ICE 884 actually starts traveling on two different sets of track. You see. Exactly, Neon, but it was fixed in later ICE train designs. The line and the branch line. The main line and the branch line. Ooh. How can this have happened? Which stand about two meters from the tracks. It's this proximity to the railway that becomes the new focus of inquiry. And then phew, it helps to piece together the next sequence of it. And, and then phew, the bridge collapsed. Directly into the pillars. ICE 884 crashes into the Escheder Road Bridge. The third car. But the windows are shattered. And then the rest of the coaches jackknifed into each other while the first two sped on. So much. It's just impossible to imagine how it was so completely smashed up. Yeah, that's what happens. Putting in the night gun, alright. Oh, terrible. Yeah, I know, Stan, I know. It was actually on the 3rd of June, 1998. Exactly six years... Exactly six years before I was born. Six years to the day. I still find that incredible. How this disaster happened exactly six years to the day before I was born. A hundred and one people were killed and 88 were injured. A hundred and one, even more than the Spanish train crash. The world's worst ever high-speed rail disaster. Jesus. Yeah, you can't talk about high-speed train disasters without talking about the Ashede crash. Yeah, after Steve, uh, Stephen brought up the Spanish one, I just had to bring up the Ashede one. Right then, so with that covered, uh, what now? Are you still there, James? don't really feel like, uh... Oh, thanks, CBB's fan. Oh, you are there, James. And, and, and Neon, are you still there? Right, uh... Oh, you are still there, good. I've seen that occur with a less tragic incident. What happened with Dutch trains at Hiversum? Was there a video of that, Neon? Okay, I guess, uh... I guess, uh, now we'll, um, let's, I guess now we'll, uh, just talk about, just watch a video of a random high-speed train journey from Super Labs Travels. Just a random high-speed train journey. Super, 
Super Amps Travel. Oh, I don't know, Dave. All right then, Dave. Uh, welcome. Right. Uh, let's uh, see. Oh, I think I may have seen it. Oh yeah, I saw a recommended for this. Oh yeah, this looks far less fatal. I don't think anyone died in this, but I have seen this before. But I think similar things happened here. It happened at a much lower speed. Still pretty bad, though. Still pretty bad derailment, though. And you gotta love how the how how it how the pantographs are, because as the train derails. Here we are, high-speed trains. Let's have a look. Kind of like the Dutch NS trains. Oh, I thought you wouldn't... Oh, I thought you wouldn't like how the... Um, how, how, how one of them... How the ICM units have, like, an upward cab like that. It's a protruding upward cab. That's what matters. Exactly. Let's see which one. Let's do, let's see him talk about this Italian one. Paramount Forever? Oh, I don't know. Uh, a. Smith. Yeah, let's talk about this Italian one. Yeah, I, um, I wasn't, as I said, I wasn't sure how many different high-speed trains we'd be talking about, uh, today, but, um, I guess the Italian one will be good, uh. Especially as it's based on the AGV design, the advanced AGV design. Um, all right, if Odd doesn't show up by um, half past, uh, if Odd doesn't show up by nine o'clock, then we'll I'll show everyone that TGV video I wanted to show you all. But for now, uh, let's watch this video. Right. Italy sees a lot of high-speed trains from a lot of different operators. In a country with so many different oh, high-speed services, how do you choose the best one? I've, I've been on, uh, I've been on the direct Paris to Milan TGV service before. Hello, Unman Uster, welcome. Were you part of the raid? <laughs> ah, shit. The, the, the thing, the video is lagging. Um. Yeah, um, yeah, the direct, uh, Paris to Milan TGV takes ages, but, the direct Paris to Milan TGV takes ages, but, um, they are building a brand new high-speed line to, between Lyon and Turin to reduce, um, journey times on that route. It's still a fun, it's still a very scenic trip, though. All right then, Usman. You still there, Stan? Right. But I haven't been at any on any of Italy's domestic high-speed trains. Join me like today as I try out the Italo AGV on a comfy first-class journey from Italo, Turin to Milan. Italo AGV. I try out the Italo AGV on a comfy first-class journey from. 
Join me today as I try out the Italo AGV on a comfy first class journey from Turin to Milan to see if this privately operated service has what it takes to be crowned as Italy's best high speed train. Hello and welcome back to another video. Today I'm here in Torino, Porta Nuova in Italy and I'm going to be travelling on board Italy's high speed private operator, exactly. Italo. My journey today will take me over to Milano Centrale and I'll be travelling in Prima, which is their first class product. It's going to be a new experience for me, so let's go! Welcome to Torino Porta Nuova, the historical yeah, like main station dining, here in um... Italy's original capital city. T Turin was Italy's original ca capital city? I never knew that. I thought it was always Rome. I thought I thought Rome was was always Italy's capital city. I didn't realize it was Turin before. Historical main station here in Italy's original capital city. The station dates back to 1861 when Turin became Italy's capital oh, nice city deal. with construction finishing in 1868. Despite its importance, the station didn't actually have an opening ceremony until 145 years after its opening in 2009. As with most major stations in Europe these days, much of the station consists of food outlets and shops. Thankfully though, the recently refurbished main hall still retains all of its glory. What a magnificent station. Yes, it is magnificent. 21 people, nice. I apologize in the departure hall, we are met with something a lot less spectacular. A vast space somewhat resembling a regional airport, just without all the stress. You can also find ticket offices for various operators, but if you're travelling anywhere far, you're best off pre-booking online. I do at least like how they've tried to cheer things up a bit in here, with this colourful stripe on the ceiling. Yeah, it is colourful. My train today is Italo AV9947 the 1430 service to Salerno. This is a seven hour journey, but I will be traveling only as far as Milan. Only as far as Milan. Day 7, 9947, the 1430 service to Salerno. Salerno. This is a seven hour journey, but oh, I will be traveling uh, only as far as Milan. As you probably noticed, there are a lot of different services departing from Torino Porta Nuova including Italo's high-speed competition in the form of the Trenitalia Freccia Rossa. These trains are operated by the national operator, and much like Italo, serve most parts of Italy, including the uh, route to Salerno. Salerno. The range of service here is large, as you'd expect for Italy's third busiest station, after the capital and nearby Milan. To My ride today is one of these Italo AGV units, of capable of an impressive Great. 300 kilometers an hour. But they can actually go much faster though. Much My ride today is one of these Italo... I'm pretty sure they, these these are designed for 225 mile an hour operation though. Italo AGV units, capable of an impressive 300 kilometers an hour. I really like the look of these trains. Of the AGV trains. These 11 carriage trains were developed as a successor to the TGV family, with the name literally standing for high speed unit. This example was built in 2012. I'm travelling in Prima class today, which yeah, is Italo's Neon, first class um, product. Electro should be nice to hear that, should be glad to hear that, Neon. Unit. This example was built in 2012. I'm travelling in Prima class today, which is Italo's first class product. Wait a few board. minutes before departure, the train is open for boarding. Seating is in a typical 2 plus 1 layout. I'll be sitting here in coach 5, seat 6, a forward facing window seat. Yeah, I agree. I agree, Stan. They are really nice. As I said, I love I love the the very sloped aerodynamic shape of them. I love their TGV influence, how they have the um have the Jacob's bogey design where they where each carriage is shared. Yeah, it's a pretty good design. Now, first things first, I've got to mention how futuristic this interior is. 
I'm looking forward to a relaxing journey, but we'll take a better look at the train's comfort after departure. Today's route will start from Torino Porta Nuova. Nobody hangs around exactly. We'll first make a turn to serve Torino Porta Zusa before a high speed journey all the way to Milano Centrale without any stops. Nice. The journey is scheduled to take exactly Hello, one hour to cover the 148 kilometers or about 92 miles of track. Exactly an hour. We leave Torino Porta Nuova just one minute late at 14.31. Tot, tot, tot. Call this a railway, one minute late. Why is it better than three plus one seating? <coughs> Interesting announcement jingle there. Oh, three by two seating. Why is it better? Soon after departure, we enter a tunnel, taking us to our first and only intermediate station, Torino Porta Susa. This is the more modern of the two main stations in the city, located beneath the ground, not far yeah, from Torino is, Porta Nuova. This is this I believe is the last stop. This I believe is the last stop on the Paris to Milan TGV's journey before its non-stop run the main to Milan. Stations in the city, located beneath the ground, not far from Torino Porta Nuova. Exactly, Neon. I know. Back out in the open again, and we head straight onto the high speed line, where we quickly accelerate up to 300 kilometers an hour. His opinion? Yes. No, because they have better standards than most railway It's now time for the Italo Welcome Service, the complimentary catering. It's now time for the Italo Welcome Service, the complimentary catering offer here in Prima Class. This consists of either a sweet or salty snack and a drink. Nice. I chose some orange juice served at a refreshingly cool temperature and this apricot tart, which tasted Delicious. very nice. Why? Because it's red, Steve Bird. Hey, I know, James. With the food service out of the way, it's time to look at the rest of the interior, starting off, of course, with the seats, which are very well presented in a black leather design. The actual comfort on these seats is fantastic, know, with a great amount of padding, and they were a fitting shape too. On top of the seats, you can find a branded head cushion, which was soft and provided extra comfort. All seats have a pair of folding armrests, which were also well padded and comfortable. On one of these, you can find the button for recline, which allows for a more relaxed posture. Every seat gets a single plug socket, which are in an unusual but convenient location. These sockets are compatible with both European and Italian style plugs. Beneath this, you can find a well-sized bin. On the seat in front of you, there's also a seat back table of a decent size for working on. This features a cup holder, as well as rather cleverly, a cup holder only option. Beneath that, you can find a storage net, which I unfortunately found to be pretty useless, as stuff would easily fall back out. It's all right, Neon. Now finally onto legroom. There's a lot of room here, even when the seat is reclined. Yeah. You can also find a folding footrest, which further yeah, increases the comfort. Yeah, most have footrests. Much of the route today runs adjacent to the Autostrada A4 motorway. With a speed limit of 130 km an hour, the cars don't have a chance against the high speed train. Though. Exactly. Trains are better. High anyway, speed trains are let's better go for a walk around driving. the rest of the train. First up, the toilets. Most carriages on the Italo AGV have a single toilet like this one.
The toilet was in an immaculate condition, with both the soap and water working perfectly fine. However, the hand dryer was not working. Oh, Luckily, yeah. plenty of paper towels were provided. Ah, oh, dear. Exactly, it is neon. Regardless Moving of through to Smart Class, which is Italian's second class product, the style is broadly the same as in Prima Class, with the obvious difference being the denser seating layout of 2 plus 2. In Prima Class Coach 3 and Smart Class Coach 7, you can find the snack area. This consists of a hot drinks machine, as well as a regular vending machine. Though, I found prices to be very high. Pastas. Yes, I know me on it. For luggage storage, the vestibule has plenty Dad, of room. Are you still there? Luggage items stored here can be locked with a refundable deposit of 50 cents or 1 euro. 1 euro. There's also plenty of room in the overhead luggage stacks throughout the carriage. Lovely. Plus two. Yep, yeah, that's the best seating layout, 2 plus 2. Moving back to the seat, you can find a narrow storage tray next to you, perfect for keeping smaller items within reach. In front of this, there are controls for the individual reading lights, fixed to the luggage rack. Ooh, a chicken pot Between windows, you can find seat. a pair of retractable coat hooks. Additional coat hooks are found attached to the seat in front. Oh, come on, there's got to be more And than ideal for the Italian watching. heat, each window has an effective adjustable... And ideal for the Italian heat, each window has an effective adjustable blind. Also a feature on many high-speed trains. One last thing I have to mention is that there is actually carpet. Most high-speed trains in Italy don't have carpet, so this was nice to see. Interesting. Yeah, TGPs have carpet. We're fast on the approach to the city of Milan, so let's talk about the price of today's journey. On this trip, I paid €14.40 for a one-way ticket in Prima Class. This includes the Italo Young discount offered to all passengers aged 14 to 29. For the 92-mile journey, that gives a price per mile of about 13p, which I think is fantastic value for an hour on a true high-speed train, I especially agree. in first class. Yes, Great job, it, Italo. It is, we are it now is, passing through it is fantastic EP, value for which money, I think is fan and Odd considers the prices of his of his country's trains a complete joke, so if and when he comes, I'll have to ask him about this. Fantastic value for an hour on a true high-speed train, especially in first class. Great job, Italo. We are now passing through Roffiera Milano, a major commuter station that also sees occasional high-speed train stopping from both Trenitalia and Italo. Um, we did once... The UK did once have double-decker trains on the chart tearing across the Dartford line, but it didn't really work out. Pe people complained that they weren't very comfortable. Occasional high-speed train stopping from so, yeah, both Trenitalia and Italo. Italo. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to have double-decker trains in the UK. So, overall, I was really impressed with Italo today. Their service was friendly, fast, and exceptional value for money. I also yeah, really like their train's value. interiors, which are my favourite out of any high-speed train in Italy, thanks to their great comfort and ambience. Lovely. Very good. No, really good value. Italo now. also operate another type of train, the Evo, based on the Tilting Pendolino family. If you want to see nice. a video on this striking-looking train, then do let me know in the comments. I don't think he hasn't made a video. I this is the I'm final sure. approach to Milano Centrale, a terminus station where this train reverses. We arrived three minutes late at 15.33, owing to congestion at the busy junctions before the station. Congestion. So, what do you think of Italo? Do you think their AGV is Italy's best high-speed train? Leave a comment below with your thoughts. Oh, well I think it, in term, certainly in terms of looks, I think it's Italy's best high-speed train. Learning about Certainly in terms of looks, I think it's Italy's best high-speed train. Hello, Fever16. Nice to see you.
what every train company needs. Exactly. Video. Yeah, 12 viewers, that's all I get. Right, I need the toilet again. Yeah, if you guys, uh, yeah, if all doesn't show up by nine o'clock, we'll just watch the, uh, uh, TGV video then. Don't worry, Neon. Um, right, just go right into the loo again. You know the drill, guys. If anyone, um comes while I'm gone, tell them I've died in a tornado. I'll be back. Okay, I'm back. What's been happening in the chat? Chances of that? Chances of what? Yeah, you're gonna... Oh, you're back, Stan, okay. No, no! No, I haven't! I haven't, Cassie. It's Joe, I'm joking. <coughs> I'm... He's joke... Joking! Right. We haven't talked about the Eurostar yet. How should I know? Cassie, I don't care about that. Oh, there you are. Oh, you're back, Neon. Didn't even know you were gone. Okay, so we haven't talked about the Eurostar yet, so I guess we'll do that now. That's a high-speed train. Oh, hang on. What's this? Oh, there you are. 
you are, Electro. Nice to see you. Uh, Neon's here. He's been here for a while. So now... Eurostar Tunnel flooding. Oh, dear. I have no idea about this. No Odd or Victor yet, though, Electro. Right. Nice to see you. Time that very nicely. Cool. Uh, but yeah, Eurostar is the high-speed rail link, is the high-speed train link that um, links London with Paris and Brussels. Oh, Eurostar have withdrawn their direct London to Disney Land Paris service. I, I didn't know this. I did not know this at all. Ah, Disneyland Paris. Yeah, I know which option I choose. Oh. Oh, I really don't know. Yeah, I want, really want to do some sort of Eurostar video. Mark 4 Intercity DVA, Ireland's fastest train. 200, only an hour to go, 165 kilometers an hour, just over 100 miles an hour. So that's Ireland's fastest train. Yeah, I was saying earlier, Electro, that unfortunately Ireland doesn't have any, like, proper high-speed railways. Like, Ireland doesn't have any proper high-speed railways, but... I'd love... But it would be great if they did. I reckon from... I reckon a high-speed line from Cork to, to Belfast via Dublin would suit Ireland very well. Tall. Go away to Dublin on the ICR. All right. Uh, let's see. Now the calf. Well, well, Electro. If you stick around, you'll learn about the Eurostar trains. If you stick around, you'll learn about the Eurostar trains. Here we are, the class three seven. We'll, we'll go with this video, the class three seven three Eurostars. Hang on, just double check that there's no. Um... Copyright warnings. Right, class three seven three Eurostars. Let's have a watch of this. Fist bumps, Neil Smack. Oh, that's so cute. Oh, yeah, the Spanish-built ones. Oh, very cute, Neo uh, Electro. Right, so here we go. So now, now Electro, if you stick around here, you're going to learn about the um, the trains that I often... The, the Eurostar trains, the, um, the London to Paris link, high-speed link. There it is. There's a Class 373 Eurostar crossing the Medway Viaduct. And I'll be going across that in less than 40 hours. The Class 373 Eurostar is an electric multiple unit that is used for Eurostar International High Speed Rail Services from the United Kingdom to France and Belgium. By the it's a small town. country that's mostly farmland. 
Well, we're a pretty small country too, but we're but there's a high speed line under construction here, and we've already got one from London to the Channel Tunnel. Oh yeah, I think I may also talk about the history of High Speed One itself. After this. Um And France is about the same size as Ireland. Top to bottom, it's about the same size as Ireland, when you include Northern Ireland. But I France has high-speed rail lines crisscrossing it. That is used for Eurostar international high-speed rail services from the United Kingdom to France and Belgium via the Channel Tunnel. They were built between 1992 and 1996. And I reckon Ireland is still big enough for at least one high-speed railway line. I mean, I mean, the UK and America's high-speed rail is pretty bad. We're pretty bad when it comes to high-speed rail, but we're lucky to have high-speed rail at all. Canada, Australia and Ireland don't have high-speed rail when they'd be perfect for it. They were built between 1992 and 1996 and were constructed at four different locations in the UK, France and Belgium. Exactly, Neon. They are part of the TGV family of trains but built with a smaller cross section to fit the smaller loading gauge of Britain. The Class 373s were originally constructed as dual voltage units capable of operating on the UK third rail network and on No, a high speed rail line would a proper high speed rail line would still it's suit Ireland well. Pay. When I was a kid actually Electra, I meant to say when I was a kid, me and my best friend Toby actually um we we actually had fantasies of um of building our own high-speed railway line from London to Belfast. The family of trains, but under the channel with a smaller cross section to fit the smaller loading. Yes, James. Yes, we absolutely do. In fact, we should start a petition for that. A high-speed train painted up like Spyro to promote Spyro Four would be awesome. Paint up one of the Eurostar E320s in purple and yellow to look like Spyro. That would be awesome. Engage of Britain. The Class 373s were originally constructed as dual voltage units, capable of operating on the. Painting up a high speed train to look like Spyro as, as promotion for Spyro 4. I know, Neon. Plus, it would be far longer than the Channel Tunnel. The Class 373s were originally constructed as dual voltage units, capable of operating on the UK... Hello, Pokemama. I remember you from last week's stream. If you couldn't tell, this stream is themed to high-speed trains because I'm taking a high-speed train journey in less than 40 hours. And, um... And right now we're talking about the Class 373 Eurostars. The Class 373s were originally right, no. constructed yeah, as dual voltage units, capable of operating on the UK third rail network and on the AC overhead wires. I, I get what you mean, Stan. Capable of operating on the UK third rail network and on the AC overhead wires. Nice. When the first services commenced to the continent via the Channel Tunnel in 1994, they ran to and from London Waterloo via the existing third rail network. Yes. Four new platforms were constructed, as well as an arch station roof, which formed the new Waterloo International Station. Is everyone paying attention oh. to this, to this video? After the opening of the Channel Tunnel Rail Link, later renamed High Speed One, services moved to the newly refurbished St Pancras International Station. Exactly. There were two types of Class 373s constructed. 
Yeah, um, so, but, so, if you guys want to know why the, um, why the Eurostars ran on the, on the DC Third Rail Network in England before HS1 opened. Nice, Electro. If you guys want to know why the Eurostars, um, if you guys want to know why the Eurostars operated on, um, If you guys want to know why the Eurostars operated on the third rail lines during the first 13 years of their life, it's because when uh, LGV Nord opened, when when LGV Nord um, was being planned, that's the French high-speed railway line from Paris to Calais via Lille, when that was being planned, a... Um, a um, a counterpart high-speed railway line was also being planned. The original concept for HS1 would have run via Tunbridge and Croydon into London, Victoria. But the mostly anti-rail Thatcher government, at the, the mostly anti-rail Margaret Thatcher government at the time, refused to provide funding for this proposed high-speed line, which is why... Which is why, from 1994 to 2003, the Eurostars were forced to run, to run entirely on the third rail system from, from the Channel Tunnel into London Waterloo. It wasn't until 2003 when the first phase of HS1 opened, as far as, as far as South Fleet Junction, just south of Ebbsfleet. It wasn't until then, when the when the UK finally had a high speed line. But even then, but even then, the Eurostars still had to use the third rail, the third rail from, from, from South Fleet Junction into London Waterloo. But then, when the rest of the line opened, but then, when the rest of HS1 opened in 2007, the high-speed line was able to go all the way into London. And Eurostars have been running out of London St Pancras. The, the Eurostars have been running out of London St Pancras over HS1 ever since. When will HS2 be finished? How should I know? At this point, we'll be lucky if HS1 is if HS2 is finished by 2040. Yeah, at this point, we'll be lucky if it's finished by 2040. Yes, they have. These comprised of 31 three capital sets consisting of two power cars and 18 passenger coaches, measuring 387 metres in length. These were some of the longest passenger trains ever built, I believe. Hello, Levko, welcome. The length of a complete set is dictated by the Channel Tunnel Safety Regulation. Still there, Stan? The length of a complete set is dictated by the Channel Tunnel Safety Regulation. Ah, oh, right. I thought the reason they were so long is because... I thought the reason they were so long is because um, they knew that these trains would be extremely popular. I thought it was because they knew these trains would be extremely popular. The London to Paris service would be extremely popular. But no, it's to do with channel tunnel safety regulations. That's interesting. As the distance between consecutive cross passages is 375 metres. Yeah, what is it, Pokemon? This means that if a Eurostar train has to stop inside the tunnel in case of an emergency, it would always stop adjacent to a cross passage. There are also seven North of London sets, also known as regional Eurostars, with 14 coaches and two power cars, which Still were just there, over 312 metres. 14 coaches and two power cars. Yeah, they were. Which were just over 312 metres in length. These sets were intended to provide regional Eurostar services from continental Europe to and from north of London using the West Coast Main Line and the East Coast Main Line. Oh, interesting. But these services never came to fruition for a variety of reasons. Yeah. In May 2000, two regional Eurostar sets were exactly. linked to GNR. Indeed, Neon. May 2000, two regional Eurostar sets were leased to GNER. 
to operate the white road services from London's King's Cross to York. And dark. From May 2002, the white road was altered to operate to Leeds, with the third set being leased. Some of the sets had the GNER livery applied, whereas the rest they look carried great the, in the, the, the class three seven three the threes look great in the leased. GNER livery. Some of the sets had the GNER livery applied, whereas the rest carried the original Eurostar livery, but without logos. The lease on these units expired in December 2005, and they were handed back to Eurostar. They were later used to operate high-speed TGV services with SNCF in northern France. Yeah. The following clips depict the Class 373s operating on the HS1 line between London and the Channel Tunnel. These look awesome. Look awesome. Uh. Exactly, Neon. Welcome back, Bash. But yeah, HS One is truly where these trains belong. Oh, nice, Neon. Very nice. Microsoft Train Simulator. Oh well, yeah, HS One also has these emergency sidings. Safety reasons. I think I did it anyway. Nice. Where's Electro disappeared to? What's this? Putting out artwork I did for Neos on my community post. Okay, cool. But yeah, there you have it, Electro. These are the Eurostar trains. The E300s or the class... Um, or the class 373s. This may be an unpopular opinion, but in brute honesty... I do prefer the E320s or Class 374s over the E300s. Oh, nice, Neon. The only, um... The only section I had was York to Newcastle. So did I, Neon. Oh, this is an... Oh, this... Oh, that's an awesome place to film the HS... HS1 trains on the um, the Medway Viaduct just to the south of Rochester. Ah, oh, this is an awesome structure. This is an awesome structure. Somewhere in the corner, in the distance, there is Diggerland. You're wrong. Oh, God. In the distance, there is Diggerland, a theme park. That's actually themed to diggers with actual real diggers that you can drive. There we are, heading towards North Downs Tunnel. Adult versions of the Thomas songs. Those are hilarious. 373s and you like both the 373s and 374s? Cool. Uh, but Electro, in case you didn't hear, in case you didn't hear me, Electro, these trains actually used to run. In case you didn't hear me, Electro, these trains actually used to run on the DC Third Rail system, a uh, British system, into um, into London Waterloo because there was no high-speed rail at the time because the stupid anti-rail Thatcher government 
the stupid anti-rail Margaret Thatcher government refused to fund a high-speed railway line from the Channel Tunnel into London at the time. Even though, even though LGV Nord was still being built at the time. Steam engine crossing that bridge? That would be just as awesome, Levco. If the Eurostars were steam trains, if the Eurostars were steam trains, they would absolutely be A4s. Ab yeah, they would absolutely be A4s. A4 locomotives. They would absolutely be A4 locomotives if the Eurostars were steam trains. So I take it you prefer the, th the class 373s over the 374s, Stan. Where's Odd? Where are Odd and... I wonder where Odd and Victor are. It'd be awesome if they were here. So yeah, I'm personally hoping that it's gonna be an E... That it's gonna be an E320. I'll have them out of St. Pancras. But it's probably going to be an E300 or Class 373 because the, e the E300s are mostly used on London to Brussels services these days. On the 30th of July 2003. But a few, um, but a few, um, a few uh, E300s still run to Paris. Shame I wasn't waiting for a train and allowed to visit the first class lounge. Yeah, it was. Unfortunately, though, Neon, before HS1 came along, St Pancras was actually a pretty horrible station. The the gla the William Barlow designed glass roof had had all been um had all been padded over, put covered up with cor with corrugated metal sheeting to repair World War One and World War Two bomb damage. It was dark and dingy. It was full of diesel fu fumes. There was, there was homeless people, drug dealers everywhere, it was full of drug needles. It, it was, a, it was, and fewer than half a dozen trains used St Pancras before HS1 came. It was just an awful station. But that, but of course, everything changed when HS1 arrived and St Pancras was returned to its glory days. They could have just as easily used King's Cross or Liverpool Street for HS1. For the, for the London terminus of HS1. But yeah, they definitely went with St Pancras for the London terminus. Because of, because it was in, it was in desperate need of renovation anyway. No, no, Electro. St Pancras, um, Liverpool Street is the terminus of the Stansted Express. Why are they complaining about the high speed railway line if there's another one being built nearby? I don't know. It was simply because the Margaret Thatcher government was really against railways at the time, which was stupid of them. What do trains need, Electro? I agree, it is very classy. Yeah, I like, yeah, I like them too, the Electro. Look, you looked at St Pancras for a minute and left. By 2003. London St Pancras Cross. Class 373 Eurostar set a new British rail speed record when it reached a speed of 334.7 kilometres per hour or 208 miles per hour. That's the speed record. That is the British rail... That is the British... Yes, we did, Stan. We did talk about exactly that when we met up. 0.7. Because I know how much you hate Margaret Thatcher, so I thought I'd give you another reason to hate her. Kilometers per hour, or 208 miles per hour. That was the exact real-life speed record that Vitesse beat in Season 3, Episode 3, Mr. Eric's Thrill Ride. When he approached the Medway Viaduct in Kent. 208 miles an hour, the fastest a train has ever been in, in, in the UK. Until, of course, Vitesse beat it when he hit 225 miles an hour. Personal generators. What do you mean by personal generators, Electro? Oh, 
Well, there's one making its way In slow. 2008, the UK-based Class 373s began to receive a midlife update. I have, mm, I don't think so, Ace Mare. Including a redesigned interior and a new livery. <laughs> oh, God, James. In October 2010, Eurostar ordered 10 Class 374 Valero trains from Siemens. Yeah, these are the new Eurostar The intention trains. was to retain 8 Class 373 sets to run alongside the new trains. The rest and they still of do the that today. To be to run alongside the new trains. The rest of the fleet would either be scrapped or stored. Exactly, Neon. Those eight trains are still in service. Oh great, Levko, and what do you think of my face? Strange that Odd and Victor aren't here. I like the new liveries. Nice. Oh, here it comes. So, yeah, what do you mean by personal generators, Electro? Are you busy typing? Thanks, Levco. Save me on. Oh yeah, the this recent pandemic has seen a dramatic reduction. Oh yeah, th this is pro this was probably filmed near um. Uh, well, I think somewhere near the channel. I'm not a hundred percent sure. The recent pandemic has seen a dramatic reduction in international travel. Which has meant far fewer. Which, ha which, but yeah, but, but now it's over. Um, people have started. Um, now, now that it's over, people have started travelling internationally again, and including it's myself. Seen a dramatic reduction in international I know, travel, Levco. which has meant far fewer Eurostar services running across to France. The few that have run have been operated by the newer Class Three Seven Fours. However, as things are now starting to return to normal, and Class 373 have. has returned into service in recent weeks on test and training runs along HS1. God. God. Oh wait, oh wait, that's the... Uh Looks like that's the end of that video. Okay, I'll read I'll read what Electro has written now. Induction principle. The turning of the wheels can spin a generator turbine, changing the copper wires magnetic field, creating electricity so the train can run on its own. Oh, I see. So the train generates its own electricity through the movement of its wheels. That's an interesting idea, Electro. The train generates its own electricity through the through the rotation of its own wheels rather than taking power from overhead lines or a third rail. That's a very interesting idea, Electro. I never would have thought of that. Obviously, though, the train would need a battery so, so it could actually start up and keep going. But the movement of its of its wheels is what charges the battery. Now that's a very interesting idea. What do you all think of Electro's idea, guys? A train that generates its own electricity through the turning of its own wheels. What do you all think of that idea, guys? When it needs to stop cutting the power line, trying to free roll to a stop and using brakes if necessary. Cool. 
I've, I've already talked about the XPT in a past live stream, Levco. And plus, I don't know, Levco. I, um, I'm not really that interested in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, A eh, Smith. Exactly, Neon. Trains which put el electricity... Exactly, Neon. Trains which put electricity back into the electrical wires, the overhead wires, as they break. Take away from the 34 billion tons of CO2 emission that are released from the atmosphere from the use of fossil fuels. 34 billion tons. Is that every year around the world? Is that every year, Electro? I'll see you in hell. <laughs> Is that to say you're going to bed now, Alevko? <sighs> Power stored in batteries. Well, no, well, uh, well, a launch system would be a bit more expensive. It would be a lot cheaper to start the, to get the train moving with battery power and then keep it going with electricity generation through its wheels. Yeah, this is very nice, Electro. Going to bed in half an hour? Okay. Okay, so as on and Victor are still aren't here. If they're both not here, they may have gone to see Godzilla vs. Kong again. I really don't know. Alas, they're still not here. Hotel for dogs? Oh, no. I guess now we'll, uh... Talk about the TGV. We can't watch any mustard videos, because they'll oh, get copyright deep. claimed. After we've watched this video, we'll watch that video. Part Paris to Marseille at 320 kilometers an hour by TGV right. Duplex. Empire in the name. Oh, what was the other one? My knowledge of renewable energy systems would help me out. Indeed. Right, here we are, the TGV. This is the train I'm going to be traveling on between Lille and Lyon. Oh, yeah, Ghostbusters frozen out in Europe. Still had a fighting chance. And that was the Tran à Grande Vitesse, or TGV. That's Vitesse's basis. When first conceived in the mid-1960s, the project was considered dead on arrival. But after rigorous developments, testing and prototyping, arrival, the high-speed rail system yes. presented in 1981 was a world-class operation that proved that there was still hope yet against the car and the domestic airliner. The concept of the TGV started with two fundamental factors. The Shinkansen of Japan, and the yeah. creation of nuclear-powered energy. Shinkansen. Following World War II, much of the French railway system had been destroyed or damaged by aerial bombing and vicious land battles that had occurred between the retreating Germans and advancing allies. No, I don't As such, know. the National Rail Operator of France, the Société Nationale des Chemins de Fer de France, had essentially a clean slate on which to rebuild their railways, and thus chose to both iron out many of the sharper corners to increase speeds, and to electrify as many main lines as possible. Nice. French intercity trains between Paris, Lyon and Bordeaux North therefore became Lyon. among the fastest trains in Europe, with a top speed of between 110 and 125 miles an hour, hauled primarily by electric locomotives such as the CC7100. What do you want about Pokemon, However, Mama? not all primary routes between Paris and the nation's main regional centres could be connected efficiently due to unfavourable topography, especially to the south and east of France, where the gradient of hills meant that railways were forced into winding valley floors. That's cute, Electro. This disadvantage was particularly problematic in the late 1950s and early 60s, as domestic air travel and the motorway networks began to spread across Europe, making both long and short distance journeys far more efficient than the comparatively lumbering railway system. Ugh. I've said it before and I'll say it nation, again. People were, were very arrogant to think that cars and planes would be the future. Trains are still, are still as domestic air travel viable and today. Began to spread across and I'm Europe, glad people are realising that short now. Distance journeys far more efficient than the comparatively lumbering railway system. Lumbering my ass. 
due to the size of the French nation, air services operated by the new domestic carrier, Air en Terre, cut journey times in half, and SNCF were faced with falling passenger numbers on its top expresses to northern, western and southern France. Thankfully, a solution presented itself in the Far East, that being the new Shinkansen high-speed railways of Japan. Which we talked about earlier. Japan had pioneered dedicated high-speed railways in the years prior to World War II, as, much like France, the nation was constrained by mountainous volcanic landscapes like that were difficult World to navigate. War II, actually. The nation was constrained by mountainous volcanic landscapes that were difficult to navigate. Rather than building a railway that hugged the coastline to avoid the peaks of central Japan, exactly engineers neon. chose instead to build high-speed lines that forced their way through mountains and across valleys on a series of tunnels and viaducts, taking the shortest possible alignment between the country's major centres. The first route, the Tokaido Shinkansen, began construction between be Tokyo on. and Shin Osaka in April 1958, and on October 1st, 1964, the service commenced with a top speed of 130 miles an hour, shaving three hours off the journey time. Nice. Initially, French designers were hesitant to consider the construction of a steel wheel high-speed railway in the same vein as the Shinkansen, and instead proposed concepts such as the Aerotrain, an experimental tracked air cushion vehicle that was first tested in 1965. Which would later the aerotrain could Mac almost be Lab. likened to a hovercraft on a monorail, whereby the train rode on a cushion of air over a reinforced concrete track and was propelled by twin turbine helicopter engines. Cool, he's still there, uh, Electro and uh, Mac Stan. With twin turbine helicopter engines. With a maximum speed of 267 miles an hour reached, development of the Aerotown ended in 1977, when the project was deemed too costly to implement. In the meantime, the French railways turned to gas turbine technology as a means of accelerating routes that were constrained by their geography. Gas turbine. And from 1967, the first series of turbo That's trains were introduced, which could operate at up to 160 miles an hour. Nice. As energy was comparatively cheap during the 1960s, the general theme of future high-speed rail operations was to have trains operate using gas turbine power plants, primarily based around helicopter engines. That would have been interesting. Gas turbine exactly units, neon. while suffering from severe fuel consumption, did present several advantages over Gas diesel turbine. and petrol powered alternatives. There were fewer moving parts, thereby reducing the need for lubrication and reducing overall maintenance costs, and they were smaller in size, but could easily provide power outputs equal or greater to those from regular piston engines. Are you still there, Electro? Therefore, based on the combination of both gas turbine technology and the potential for dedicated high-speed railways, the French government launched Project C03 on July 10th, 1967, this project being titled Rail... Well, project for now we're talking about gas we turbine could easily trains. Power outputs equal well, he or is. To those from regular piston engines. But you'll see why the gas turbine high-speed train well, idea never took off in a moment. Powered alternatives. There were fewer moving parts, thereby reducing the need for lubrication and reducing overall maintenance costs, and they were smaller in size, but could easily provide power outputs equal or greater to those from regular piston engines. Therefore, based on the combination of both gas turbine technology and the potential for dedicated high-speed railways, the French government no. nation of engines... Well, yeah, they were fuel guzzlers. That, that was one problem with gas turbine trains. They were... You found a train that has its own generators... Uh, no electro. Right now we're talking about the uh, the um, we're talking about gas turbine trains like LPG powered high speed trains, which was the original idea for um for the TGV that they would be gas turbine trains instead of electrically powered, but it didn't work because one the um because the gas turbine engines were fuel guzzlers. And the other reason he's about to explain. Therefore, based the on the combination of both neon, gas turbine yes. technology and the potential for a dedicated high-speed railway, based on the combination of both gas turbine technology and the potential for a dedicated high-speed railway, the French government launched Project C03 on July 10th, 1967. This project being titled Rail Transport Possibilities Through New Infrastructure. Here it is, the gas turbine TGV. The proposal called for a segregated high-speed railway between Paris and Lyon, which would follow the straightest possible alignment between the two cities regardless of the terrain. While there would be viaducts and tunnelling where necessary, 
The French high-speed rail project. Gas turbines. That wouldn't work. It's far too harmful to the environment. I'm sure I would be in this day and age, but back in the 60s and 70s, they didn't think so. What makes gas turbines so harmful to the environment, Electro? While there would be viaducts and tunnelling where necessary. Exactly, the and the train that VTES is based on. While there would be viaducts and tunnelling where necessary, the French high-speed rail project, unlike the Shinkansen, would climb and descend slopes rather than forcing its way through them. And while this presented gradients that would be far too steep for regular trains to ascend, the proposed new series of high-speed express units for the route would be expected to pass over them without problems. The first prototype for what was to become the Train à Grand Vitesse, or high-speed train, was a gas turbine unit consisting of two power cars and three articulated coaches, commissioned from French train manufacturer Alstom by SNCF in 1969. The TGV prototype, known as TGV-001, was a multiple unit wherein each set of bogies was powered to improve acceleration, and was propelled by two Turbomecha Termo turbines carried over from the Super Freilon transport helicopter. Interesting, powered by helicopter engines. The use of shared bogies on the carriages was done to increase the stability of the entire train set, and permitted the suspension to be placed near the centre of gravity for each carriage, thus reducing rolling in curves. It also presented a major safety factor, in that if the train was to derail at high speed, the connected bogies would keep the train set largely in one piece, thus reducing the risk of rollover or individual carriages tumbling, as well as keeping the consist upright. TGV-001 was rolled out of the Alstom factory. Ah, uh, uh, so does gas, so do gas... Ah, uh, okay, so does LPG and gas turbine engines. Do they produce... Do gas turbine engines produce far more carbon emissions than than traditional petrol and diesel engines? Do they produce... So yeah, do gas turbine engines produce far more CO2 emissions than traditional petrol and diesel engines? That kills them along with the heat? I know. As a feature at all. Exactly, Neon. But it would have... But, but this would have been how the TGV was powered even today. Gas turbine TGVs would have made it into service had it not been for one particular event in 1973. TGV 001 was rolled out of the Alstom factory on March 24, 1972, and began tests around Aquitaine I on like April 4. The styling of the train, penned by designer Jacques Cooper, was ironically owed to the railway's main rival, the car, with Cooper claiming to have taken the two-tone orange and white colour scheme from the 1970 Porsche 9146 Muren concept sports car. Nice. You'll see, you'll see in testing, a moment. TGV you'll 00. see in a moment, Levco. During testing, TGV-001 became the fastest railed vehicle in the world when it reached 198 miles an hour on December 8, 1972, yeah, and today still holds the record hour, for fastest nice. gas turbine-powered train. You think he'll do another Just raid, uh, Pokemama, on my channel? 198 miles an hour on December 8th, 1972. And okay, today still holds the record for fastest gas turbine-powered train. Nice. Such was the success of gas turbine technology in rail vehicles, that the concept was also adopted in many other new train designs, including the British APT tilting train prototype. There you are, Neon. It was used in the ATV. As testing of TGV-001. There you are, Neon. It was used in the ATP prototype as well. The concept was also adopted in many other new train designs, including the British APT tilting train prototype. Electra, I'm not sure if you heard me, or, or if you're still, or if you're typing a long message, but how come, um... How come, uh... Uh, are, um, do gas turbine engines produce more CO2 emissions than traditional diesel and petrol yeah, engines? Designs, including the British APT tilting train prototype. As testing of TGV-001 continued, approval was granted by oh, the Interministerial Committee. LPG to... is just propane and butane unrefined and therefore are not as efficient with trains. Gas has to be refined in order in order to turn it into proper fuel and residue. 
LPG is weak like crude oil. All right. Ah, oh, okay, Electro. Yeah, that makes complete sense now. As testing of TGV-001 continued, approval was granted by the Interministerial Committee to build a high-speed railway between Paris and Lyon, a distance of 254 miles. However, in October 1973... Right, this is why... This is the main reason why, um... Why gas turbine TG why gas turbine the trains never became commercially viable? A distance viable. of 254 miles. Uh. However, in October 1973, the project was dealt a severe blow when, following the Yom Kippur War, wherein the Western nations openly provided support to Israel in their struggle against the combined forces of Egypt, Syria, and Jordan, the organization of Arab petroleum exporting countries implemented an oil embargo against the nations of Canada, Japan the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, and the United States, later followed by Portugal, Rhodesia, and South Africa. With this, the price of oil spiked dramatically, resulting in the oil crisis and subsequent economic recession. So that's why it was because of the 1973 oil crisis. It's not purely because they were fuel guzzlers. That's what killed the gas turbine TGV, the 1973 oil crisis. Suddenly, gas turbine technology was seen as extremely inefficient when compared yes, to Pokemon conventional Mama. diesel. What suddenly, is it? Gas turbine technology was seen as extremely inefficient when compared to conventional diesel and petrol powered engines. I know it is Pokemon. Is he going to raid me or is he going to raid other people? Suddenly, gas turbine technology was seen as extremely inefficient when compared to conventional diesel and petrol powered engines and the TGV-001 unit fell rapidly out of favour. And they were wildly inefficient when compared to conventional diesel and petrol-powered engines, and the TGV-001 unit fell rapidly out of favour. An alternative had to be sought, and the solution presented itself in the form of nuclear power and overhead electric wires. Yeah, nuclear power. France had long been associated with nuclear power, with Henri Becquerel, having discovered natural radioactivity He's raid. In the oh, internet right. with nuclear power, with Henri Becquerel having discovered natural radioactivity in the 1890s, and the French government being strongly involved with the development of nuclear power before and during World War II. The nation opened its first nuclear power station in 1962, and following the oil crisis of 1973, Prime Minister Pierre Mesmer announced the eponymous Mesmer Plan on March 6, 1974 which proposed that all of I France's know, power Mama, you just would be said. based on, on March 6, 1974, which proposed that all of France's power would be based on atomic energy rather than oil imports from its many colonies. Yep, atomic energy. And I think that's still the case today. All of France's atomic electricity is generated oil imports through from its many colonies. electricity. Uh, sorry, <laughs> electricity. Rather I mean nuclear power. From its many colonies. The Mesmer Plan has since seen over 70% of France's domestic power production be based on nuclear fuel. Yep. And the same goes for all of the all of France's rail, railway lines, both classic and high-speed lines. Since seen over 70% of France's domestic power production be based on nuclear fuel. And with the announcement, the TGV project was hastily modified to be based on overhead electric systems energised at 25 kilovolts AC. Well, no, Neil, not trains directly powered by nuclear fuel, but trains powered by electricity generated by nuclear fuel. Well, directly nuclear powered trains, well, directly nuclear powered trains have been, were proposed in the past, in the 50s, but they never caught on. But yeah, this is the closest we have at the moment. This is the closest we have, um... Power generated, uh, electricity generated through nuclear fuel. On nuclear fuel. And with the announcement, the TGV project He's was hastily there, modified to be based on overhead anti -matter electricity. Anti-matter trains. Now, what even is anti-matter? ...domestic power production be based on nuclear fuel. And with the announcement, the TGV project was hastily modified to be based on overhead electric systems energised at 25 kilovolts AC. In response, Alstom took one of the two coaches from an accident-damaged gas turbine railcar, Z7115, 
and rebuilt it into electric rail car Z7001, named Zebulon, Zebulon, which was released from the Alstom factory in April 1974 and began trials on the main line between Paris and Lyon exactly. via Boon. And began trials on the main line between Paris and Lyon via Boon. Boon. So. During its 20 months of trials, in which it reached over 186 miles an hour and racked up over 500,000 miles of distance, many structural yeah, developments for the new electric miles an hour. During its 20 months of trials, in which it reached over 186 miles an hour and racked up over 500,000 miles of distance, many structural developments for the new electric-based TGV set were tested on Zebulon, including the new Wise right, 226 long wheel based TGV set were tested on Zebulon, including the new Wise 226 long wheel based power truck a precursor to the Y230 unit used on the production TGV sets, a two-stage high-speed pantograph, and a new type of eddy current rail brake. Zebulon was it's also fitted on. with non-pneumatic suspension, and this proved to be perfectly suited to its high-speed operations as opposed to the pneumatic suspension on TGV001. With the technology behind the new electric TGV trains now proven to work well, on March 23, 1976, French Prime Minister Jacques Chirac signed a decree to commence construction on the new LGV Sud-Est route between Paris and Lyon, and building started on December 7th of that year. Yeah, much more efficient building started on construction, December 7th of that much year. faster construction than HS2. Basically a As theoretical form of energy that is said to only be formed using astronomical amounts of energy. It's very efficient. But if any sort of matter can contact it, kablamo! Oh my god, that would be a oh, that's that would be ridiculous. It commenced construction on the new LGV Sud-Est route between Paris and Lyon. All right, and building started on December seventh. John Murray, thanks year. for coming. See you next week. As construction of the line progressed through the French countryside, matters soon turned to the design of the trains themselves. Again, Jack Cooper was called in to develop the electric production variants of the train, with the sets being built by Alstom at their factory in Belfort. Yeah, it seems they were originally proposed as double-decker trains, but um, but the double-decker trains wouldn't come until much later. Oh, it seems Stan has disappeared. Cooper's main incentive with both the prototype and electric pre-production prototypes was to build a train that encapsulated the concept of speed, but at the same time yeah. wasn't too alienating for potential travellers with awesome. interior spaces designed to be as accommodating and aesthetically pleasing as possible. Ah, oh, the TGVs look so awesome. While the final exterior design of the electric prototype... I want one much. now, now that you mention it, James. While the final exterior I'll be back design soon. Oh, how come you have to go, Electro? While the final exterior design of the electric prototypes didn't right, differ too much from the TGV001, there was much debate as to how the interior would be laid out, with multiple compromises having to be made. I know, Jupiter... While Cooper envisaged a design that would harken back to the interior would be laid out, with multiple compromises having to be made. While Cooper envisaged a design that would harken back to the golden era of rail travel, SNCF were determined to ensure that the TGV didn't sacrifice too much of its capacity in order to recoup the program's substantial costs. Eventually, a decision was made to develop an interior that was both functional and comfortable, a true mixture of style and substance that would meet the requirements for SNCF's minimum passenger numbers, while not being too cramped or uninviting. With the train design completed, the first batch of two pre-production prototypes was ordered on November 4th, 1976, and on July 28th, 1978, these trains emerged from the Belfort factory, these sets being named Patrick and Sophie. Mm. Cute how they gave them names. Sadly, testing of the two TGV sets didn't go smoothly, and there were many teething problems to be countered. The main concern regarding the sets were intolerable vibrations caused by the primary suspension springs, but this fault was alleviated through the fitting of rubber blocks under the springs. Rubber blocks under the springs, okay. Eventually, over 15,000 modifications were made to Patrick and Sophie by the time the first production unit, number 03, was delivered by Alstom on April 23rd. Eventually, over 15,000 modifications were made to Patrick and Sophie by the time the first production unit, number 03, was delivered by Alstom on April 25th, 1980. Six months later, full track laying for the LGV Sudest was completed on November 20th, 
and from early 1981, TGV sets were undergoing testing on the route, with SNCF ordering an initial 87 sets from Alstom to run the service. On February 26, 1981, an ambitious record run was undertaken by Alstom and SNCF called Operation TGV-100, a proposal to run a production TGV set on the LGV Sudest in order to attain a speed of 100 metres per second or 224 miles an hour. Why is cool neon? Setting off from 224 miles an hour. 224 miles an hour? Nice. Setting off from corsel Fremois in the Cote d'Or, approximately 127 miles south of Paris, Production set number 16 began its northbound run at approximately 3 p.m. and would travel around 76 miles to Die. During the run, the train not only broke the 100 meters per second mark, but would go on to a top speed of 236 miles an hour while coming down a gradual descent, making it the fastest steel rail train in the world. Yes, 380 kilometers. The TGV 100 record would stand until May 15, 1990 when another TGV set would reach 320 miles an hour while travelling along the LGV Atlantique between Paris and Tours. 515 kilometres an hour. With the TGV project having proven its worth, the LGV Sud-Est was opened on September 22, 1981 by French President François Mitterrand, yeah. followed five days later by the first commercial operation of the first phase of the route between saint florentin 85 miles south of Paris, Thanks, to mont 68 miles north of Lyon. This would be complemented by the opening of Phase 2 in September 1983, with the new northern terminus of the route being combs la 15 miles south of Paris. The success of the LGV Sud-Est and the dedicated TGV sets. Oh yeah, now France has expanded into a much, much bigger um, LGV the success network. The success of the LGV Sud-Est and the dedicated TGV sets spurred on a rolling plan to see new LGV routes introduced across the French nation, with the LGV Atlantique to Le Mans and Tours opening in 1990, the LGV Nord to Lille, Calais and the Channel Tunnel opening in 1993, the LGV Rhone Alps to Valence opening in 1994, followed in 2001 by the second phase of the route to Avignon and Marseille, the LGV S to Nancy in 2007, followed by the second phase to Strasbourg in 2016, the LGV Rhine Rhone between Dijon and Mulhouse in 2011, the LGV Sud Europe Atlantique to Bordeaux, and the LGV Bretagne Pays de la Loire to Rennes, which both opened in 2017, and finally the LGV Mediterranean extension to Montpellier in 2018, while many more are proposed for delivery before 2030. Yeah, I've, I've already talked about the one from Lyon to, to, to Turin. One is also planned from Nice to Marseille. I'm good, okay. I'll always remember it too, Neon. Even taking time to draw it? Yes. Think of all of these proposed ones. The only one that's currently under construction is the Leon to Turin one that's being blasted through the Alps on what will become the world's longest railway tunnel. Yeah, there's already a high-speed line between Perpignan and Barcelona, built by Renfe. There's al yeah, there's already a high-speed line between Perpignan and Barcelona. But now we've got a high-speed line to Montpellier. Exactly, Neon. It's where all, most of the ones converge into. Most of the high-speed lines converge into. We really need the one between Montpellier and Perpignan, because... I've been on, I've been on the Montpellier to Perpignan section a fair few times, which, between Montpellier and Perpignan, the, um, the TGV has to use the classic lines before it goes on to the high-speed line between Perpignan and Barcelona. But it, it just crawls along between Montpellier and Perpignan, and stops at so many places, it's ridiculous. The Lyon to um, Barcelona high-speed train doesn't stop at as many places, thankfully. It's still ridiculous how slow it goes between there. It's Montpellier to Perpignan adds a good two hours to the journey time. It's, 
It really is ridiculous. So yeah, that's that the final section between Montpellier and Perpignan to have a, a full high speed line between Paris and Barcelona is really needed. Mm. It just yeah, as I said, it just crawls along. It's scenic though. In addition. The TGV's success has inspired the creation of other European high-speed rail yeah, networks, well. many of which connect like directly to the one. French LGV route ICE. and provide international connections to Paris and other French Yes, it centers. is. V route. Yes, it is, Neon, and there's no, um, no passport border checks either. And provide international connections to Paris and other French yeah, regional yeah. centres. Uh... Stan seems to have disappeared. The TGV's and ability why to haven't Odd and Victor shown up yet? It's the nearly 9 o'clock and about a they still haven't shown up French yet. Centers. Where are they tonight? My, my the boy, Spam is for dinner. Yes, I have had French Spam countryside. tonight. The T and other French regional centres. The TGV's ability to transport passengers at high speed across the French countryside brought about a resurgence in the interest of rail travel in Europe and in so doing, destroyed the domestic French airline industry. All right, cool, Pokemama. Air on terre, after suffering... They have their reasons? Yeah, I know. Yes, Neon, no border checks, and that's... And that's made possible thanks to the Schengen Agreement. All right, nice. Fine industry. Air on terre, after airline... Brought about a resurgence in the interest of rail travel in Europe and in so doing, destroyed the domestic French airline industry. Destroyed the domestic French airline industry. Good. Pizza tomorrow? Nice. Air en terre, after suffering sustained losses on its internal operations, was fully absorbed into Air France in 1997. And even today, Air France doesn't operate regional flights between Paris and certain major cities within France due to the operation being non-competitive with the TGV. Ha! You see, guys? You see? That's the point I wanted to make in trains. What dogs tonight? Cool, you'll be back. All right, Neil. You see, guys, who cares? Who cares if they're two times faster? People don't want speed and speed alone. Stop. The point bit no stand. The, my point I was trying to make was. Um. High speed trains are competitive with planes. Who cares if high speed trains are still only half as fast as planes? People don't want. Travelers don't want speed alone. They want comfort. They want convenience. They want decent. For, they want decent hospitality, things which I believe trains are more capable of providing than planes. With planes, if you want to go city to city on a plane, you have to go through the tedious process of. Um, you have to go through the tedious process of taking a taxi, bus, or train to the airport, checking in, queuing up for security. Getting your bag checked. Potentially suffering a 60 plus minute delay. Before finally getting on the plane and then going through the slow process of taxiing. Before finally taking off. And then, and then when you land at your destination, you have to go through passport control, get your bag back. That can take up to an hour. And then you have to get a taxi from the airport into city, into the city centre. Whereas trains, um, whereas trains can take you from city to sit, from city centre to city centre, in a in a far more convenient way. And going through the process of getting to the airport and checking in. Then flying there and then getting from the airport to the city centre. That takes just as long, if not longer, 
than going from directly from city centre to city centre on a train. So yeah, that's the main reason I firmly believe that high-speed trains are better than planes. That and also... That and also because... Um, Train delays don't tend to be anywhere near as long as plane delays. Welcome back, Davin. They are convenient. For, for transcontinental travel, maybe, but for, 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 fl for traveling within a continent, not so much. Can't trains take you across the sea? They can. We've got the Channel Tunnel. And also that tunnel that I can't remember the name of between between Denmark and Sweden. So they can take you across the sea. Furthermore, the TGV trains themselves have evolved greatly since the original Sud S. Trains are better for domestic travel. Not in the case of European trains. I prefer... I've, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I prefer to use... To use the trains for international travel within Europe. Tip with the TGV. Movie trains. Oh, that. Uh, uh, Furthermore. That sounds like a good idea, TGV. actually, Lavco. I'll put a pin in that idea. Furthermore, the TGV trains themselves have evolved greatly since the original Sud Est sets of 1981, including the dedicated Atlantique sets entering service in 1989, the Rezo sets of 1990. Nah, Stan. Taking the train is more fun for me. Flying for me, especially when you're waiting around at the airport for a delay that just keeps getting longer and longer and longer. And, and walking along the cramped, the cramped aisle of a plane. It's just painful for me. The high-speed trains are way more fun to travel on. All right, no problem, Levco. Thanks for coming. See you next. The dedicated See Atlantic you next sets week. Entering service in 1989, the Rezo sets of 1993 that updated the general TGV design and also formed the basis of export models such as Amtrak's original Acela sets. I thought the I thought, the, I thought the, the ICE two was the basis of Amtrak's Acela trains, but oh well, I guess they drew inspiration from the, from the TGV Rezos as well. Unfortunately, Stan, you just seem to have far better luck with planes than me, Stan, because... Because, like, 65% of the time when I go on planes, 65% of the time, they are delayed by some amount of time. They are delayed by at least an hour. Which is ridiculous. With With... Whenever trains are delayed, it's usually no more than... 45 minutes at worst. Stuff to do in the airport. There's stuff to do at St. Pancras Station as well. The Rezo sets of 1993 that I mean, the yeah, I do like airports themselves and planes themselves and the technology behind planes. But it's it's the process of flying that I don't like. It's the process of flying I don't like. The process of Travelling on high-speed trains, I much prefer. Greatly since the original Sud Est sets of 1981, including the dedicated Atlantique sets entering service. I in can and I will say the that a better sets stand. Of 1993 that updated the general TGV design and also formed the basis of export models such as Amtrak's original Acela sets and the bi-level duplex sets introduced from 1995. The TGV train design has also lent itself to several international variants, including the original Class 373 Eurostar sets, which were officially designated TGV TMST, or Transmanche Supertrain, and versions of the French TGV sets modified for use with tri-mode electrical systems on the Thales service between Paris, Brussels, Cologne and Amsterdam. Welcome back, Neon. We're still talking about the TGVs. And versions of the French TGV sets modified Me for and Stan were just arguing about... <laughs> about... O uh, over... Over what I I per, over what I personally think of high speed trains being better for travel within Europe than than flying. The process of flying is just painful for me. Smosh super train, and versions of the French TGV so sets just modified going to get some refreshments with trimode electrical systems on the Thales service between Paris, Brussels, Cologne, and Amsterdam. 
In addition, the TGV Sudes design also formed the basis of a mail train. Both. As the TGV line, the T. If planes were any more down, if planes were were more were if planes were more goddamn reliable than they are, if they were a if they were as reliable as high speed trains, if they were as reliable as high speed trains, I would see the benefits of both. But I don't. I, I, I'm sorry. No one can change my opinion. High-speed trains are better for travel within Europe. Regardless. Regardless of if the, the journey you want to take is seven hours. As opposed to like 90 minutes by plane. Speed isn't everything. I like trains. I have a lot of old experience of high-speed trains at all. Never been on one. I've only been on the 180s. All oh, right. And yeah, and you've only been on the 225s as well. What you mean to say is you haven't been on any trains above 125 miles an hour that travel above 125 miles an hour. Just. Why not just do the one they like? Exactly, Stan. I prefer to travel to use the high-speed train, so I will continue to use high-speed trains within Europe. Planes can't be blamed for the delays. It's the airline. Yeah, I get that. Just missing the takeoff slots and things. But even so, it's... E but regardless... Regardless, Stan... Regardless, Stan, um, I still find high-speed trains more reliable than planes. Sort of high-speed train central? Yeah, in some ways it is. But the true high-speed train central in the world is China. China have like oh, nearly 40,000 kilometers of high-speed track. They absolutely have the... China absolutely have the biggest high-speed railway network. ...with tri-mode electrical systems on the Thales service between Paris, Brussels, nice. Cologne and Amsterdam. Oh, I know, Neil. In addition, the TGV Sudest design also formed the basis of a mail train, as the TGV La Poste sets that operated between train. 1984 cool. and 2015. The TGV La Poste service worked between Paris and many regional centres across France, making them the fastest freight trains in the world. And while the La Poste service was discontinued due to a major restructuring of SNCF's mail-on-rail operations, one set had the distinction of being the first TGV unit to visit London, after being dragged through the Channel Tunnel to St Pancras Station in March 2012. For the future, Alstom are currently developing a new series of TGV trains called the Avalia Horizon, a series of high-speed sets that will begin delivery from around 2023, but have already begun testing in the United States under their American designation, the Avalia Liberty, a replacement for the original Acela sets. Yeah, these look good, but I'll always prefer the classic TGV Sudest and Rezio look, and, um, uh, and, uh, uh ah, shit. And... And Rezio and uh, Atlantique, look, that's it. As a testament to the TGV's superb performance, in the 39 years since the first trains began work in 1981, no passenger has lost their life on a TGV train while running in normal service on the high-speed LGV lines, despite there being several high-speed derailments over the years. No passenger has lost their life on the high-speed lines, nice. The only fatalities involved with the TGV have either been through terrorist attacks, such as the bombing of a set in 1983 oh, no. by the infamous Carlos the Jackal, through collisions at level crossings on conventional non-LGV routes, as was the case in September 1988, when a TGV set struck a stalled 80-ton lorry, killing the driver and a passenger in the train, or while under test, as was the case of the 2015 Eckbertsheim derailment, but this was caused due to excessive speed. Mm. Nevertheless, the TGV is truly the high-speed train that helped to reinvigorate rail travel in Europe. Once these versatile express trains were introduced, they injected new life into a mode of transport that appeared to be dying, and refreshed the image of rail operations to make it competitive well into the 21st century. 
Here, here. Lovely. Thanks again for watching this video. Right. I'm gonna run to the loo again, hopefully for the last time this stream, and then I'll watch two more videos. This Paris to Marseille video by um, Midland London. I just gotta check that they aren't copyright sensitive first. And then we'll finish off this stream with the documentary on the world's fastest train. The, the record holder of the world's fastest train by that TGV POS set. That modified TGV POS set. But, and a bit more water. You know the drill if anyone comes while I'm gone, guys. Tell them I've died in a tornado. I'll be back. Okay, I'm back. Ah, bugger. So what's been happening? That's Plumber Blummer. Just remembered your channel from the raid, so I just wanted to say hello, goodbye, and have a good night. Okay. Francis... Creating new videos. Any of my ventures. Okay, I think that this will Francis. be okay with this. Paris to Marseille at 320 kilometers an hour. France's TGV has revolutionized high-speed rail, not only in Europe, but the world. There truly is no better way to travel than on one of these iconic high-speed trains. I'll be taking a first-class trip all the way from Paris down to the south of France, the country's second largest city, Marseille. Expect some stunning scenery, cafe bar hacks, and more. As yeah, there's high. France, yeah, the high-speed line now runs since 2001. It runs from Paris all the way down to Marseille. Speed scenery, cafe bar hacks, and more as we cross France at speeds of 320 km per hour. Now let's get this show on the rails. Oh yeah, as always I leave out the important stuff. I'm staying in La Défense, meaning I need to take a quick hop on the RERA to start from where the train does, Paris's Gare de Lyon station. Whilst the station itself dates back to 1849, the current station building before us originates from 1900 and features a spectacular architecture. Oh what is design. it Pokemon, is the raid about to happen? As my channel about to be raided again. For us, originates from 1900 and features a spectacular architectural design, both inside and out. As is also evidenced by the original train shed in Hall 1, dating back to the same era as the former. Whilst much of the station's iconic design is still evident today, There's it's gonna, another one, Zed. 
building before us originates from 1900 and features a spectacular architectural design, both inside and out, as is also evidenced by the original train shed in Hall 1, dating back to the same era as the former. Uh -oh. Oh, no. Whilst much of the station's iconic design is still evident today, it's currently undergoing both an internal and external refurbishment, due to be completed by 2024, nice. as is evidenced by the famous Le Plan Bleu restaurant. Gare de Lyon is a hub for many TGV services. Well, I hope the, all these people a enjoy... Uh, the the right, whilst the TGV Lyria for services to Switzerland is just next to it. Most services here... I hope all these new people enjoy... I hope they all like trains, high-speed trains in particular. As is Are you still there, Neon? The Gare de Lyon is a hub for many TGV services, both nationally and internationally. A domestic TGV can be seen to the right, whilst the TGV Lyria for services to Switzerland is just next to it. Most services here stop at Norman, which is where the name comes from. Norman Price, go to hell! Whilst the TGV Lyria for services to Switzerland is just next to it. Most services here stop at What is it, George? Which is where the name comes from. A closer look at the departure board shows us that our train is actually departing from the newer hall too and that it's also 20 minutes late. But let's not talk about that right now. Gare de Lyon is categorized mainly by two different halls. Hall 1, right, where we are well. now, lettered from platforms A to N, and Hall 2, a modern yeah, extension with platform numbers 5 Yeah, what is it, George? Simple, right? The scenes in Hall well, 2 right now three, showcase just section. how chaotic this station can be. On the day I was traveling, it was Bastille Day, a national holiday in France. This meant that even at 7 a.m., this station showcases why it's worthy of the title of both Paris's and France's second busiest station, which in normal traffic sees over 150 million passengers annually, second only to Paris's Gare du Nord station. This huge crowd isn't just here for SNCF services. Here we can see the Freccia Rossa 1000 adding some colour to this gloomy Parisian morning. Preparing he's to head to Milan. So is he about to raise Alps, this stream again or not? Before. Here we can see the Freccia Rossa 1000 adding some colour to this gloomy Parisian morning. Preparing to head to Milan via Lyon and the Alps, which I have looked at before is a stunning executive plant. All right. Boarding normally commences 20 minutes prior to departure, but as our train is 20 minutes late already, Dealing with these huge crowds is becoming quite unbearable. Not to mention the fact that despite the current chaos, ticket scans are still conducted at the gates just before departure. I honestly don't know how SNCF staff managed to do it. Before departure. I honestly don't know how SNCF staff managed to do it. Yeah. But anyway, here we are. Our train today is the famous TGV duplex built by Alstom. Each set is eight carriages long and is at present the only double-decker high-speed train in the world, capable of over 300 kilometers per hour. Yeah, there was there was also the Japanese E1 and E4 series, but yeah, that's been they've both been taken out of service now. But yeah, currently the duplexes are the only double-decker high-speed like trains Alston. in service. Each set is eight carriages long and is at present the only double-decker high-speed train in the world, capable of over 300 kilometers per hour. Our train is formed of 16 coaches, which is two eight-car sets coupled together. The set at the rear is part of the original series build, right. dating back to 2002, whilst the All front right, set then, is strangely Jupiter. enough, which is two eight-car sets coupled together. Yes, I did, George. A high-speed train in the world, capable of over 300 kilometers per hour. Our train is formed of 16 coaches, which is two eight-car sets coupled together. The set at the rear is part of the original series build, dating back to 2002, whilst the front set is, strangely enough, one of the Euro duplex sets typically found on the Paris to Barcelona route, built back in 2012. A variant of the Euro duplex operates Morocco's Al Borac service. All right, Jacob, uh, only thanks for coming. See you next week. 2002, whilst the front set is, strangely enough, one of the Euro duplex sets typically found on the Paris to Barcelona route, built back in 2012. A variant of the Euro Duplex operates Morocco's Al Borac service, which oh, is the yes. only high-speed train in Africa. 
Yeah, that very recently started operation. Which is the only high-speed train in Africa. Africa now have high-speed trains. Who would have known? Being double-decker trains makes the duplex design a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it's great for capacity, as these trains can seat over 500 people each. That's but on the other, it can be poor for accessibility, and the boarding process isn't as smooth, as can be evidenced here. Despite the train being nearly full when booking, I managed to secure a top deck seat for today's journey in first class down to Marseille, where the views are undoubtedly the best. Indeed. Our TGB first runs non-stop down the full length of the LGV Sud-Est, prior to joining the LGV Méditerranée beyond Lyon, where we then make station calls at both Avignon and Aix-en-Provence. Our journey time to Marseille will take just 3 hours and 20 minutes to cover the 800 km journey from Paris today, which should be an absolutely fantastic one. So sit back and enjoy the ride. Lung Nearly 500 miles in just 3 hours and 18 minutes. Now that is very impressive. That is how you run a tr that is how you do a train journey. Oh, there you are, uh, Neon. That is how you kick. That is how you kick every other country's railway network in the ass. Three hours and 18 minutes to cover 500 miles by train is very impressive. When I went, when I went to, to uh, when I went to Nice on the TGV from Paris, it was supposed to be non-stop from Paris to Marseille, like not even stopping at Avignon, so so a lot faster. But I think there was like an obstruction on the track, so the train was delayed by about an hour, and we stopped in a place called Le Croisette. I know, we talked about this earlier, Stan. <laughs> yeah, they do. Uh. Our departure from Paris is 24 it. minutes late at 2 minutes past 8 Central European time. Hopefully it makes up time. Very nice departure. I I have seen this view many times before, but I won't be seeing it on Sunday. I'll be taking the interconnection line. Seen shortly after the departure to the right is Paris's Bercy station. This station handles a lot of the city's regional and intercity traffic to the south of France and acts as a relief station for regional. The, though I though when I la when I last went to Port Aventura, there was a seventy minute delay f leaving Gare de Lyon. There was a seventy minute delay leaving Gare de Lyon when I went when I last went to Port Aventura in June two thousand twenty two. But that that was due to like um tech that was due to the train leaving the depot late due to technical problems with its fire alarm. Yeah, I was told that the that the train was seventy minutes late. Due to leaving the depot late, due to technical problems with its fire alarm. All right. Seen shortly after the departure to the right is Paris's Bercy station. This station handles a lot of the city's regional and intercity traffic to the south of France and acts as a relief station for Gare de Lyon, as and when necessary. Yeah, a lot of stations like we that in London as well. For Gare de Lyon, as and when necessary. All right, Jupiter. We can also see SNCF's workshop, the Technic Centre Sud-Est Européen, where SNCF's large fleet of TGVs, serving destinations to and from Gare de Lyon, is maintained. Tren Italia's dedicated Frecce Rossa fleet, used Européen, where SNCF's large fleet of TGVs, serving destinations to and from Gare de Lyon, is maintained. Tren Italia's dedicated Frecce Rossa fleet, used in France, is also stabled here. However, most heavy maintenance was done in Italy prior to the closure of the line through the Alps. 
not a fan of delays, but you have to put up with it. Oh, no. After navigating the Parisian suburbs prior to the closure of the line through the Alps. After navigating the Parisian suburbs, we quickly find ourselves on the LGB Sud-Est. This is France's original high-speed line, which opened in 1981, and was of course the first to see the iconic first-generation TGV Sud-Est trains traversing the full length between Paris and Lyon. Oh, After cool, almost James. 40 years Sud-Est trains traversing the full length between Paris and Lyon. At almost 40 years old, these trains were sadly retired in 2020. Though number 16, which set the world's original 380 km per hour speed record, nice. is now preserved by SNCF and can still be seen around France being used on special tours and showcases. Yeah, VTES has also been preserved by Mr. Eric. And can still be seen around France being used on special tours and showcases. As for our TGV oh, duplex, France being used on special tours and showcases. Someone said raid. As for our TGV duplex, oh, I know. Being did he see? Did he notice it? He will never raid again. What? Never raid my channel again? No, this time I want it. This time I actually want it. Someone tell him that this time he would rather raid someone new. All no. right. Number tell him that this time I actually want 16. it. Which set the world's original 380 km per hour speed record is now preserved by SNCF and can still be seen around France being used on special tours and showcases. As for our TGV duplex, it's currently comfortable close to the line's top speed of 300 km per hour. As for what makes these trains so comfortable, well, the first class seat is how it starts. It's incredibly plush and spacious. You could easily sit here for three hours or maybe longer. Each seat contains foldable armrests on both sides, with the right one also responsible for managing the electronic recline function, as indicated by the two arrows. This is a huge help with adjusting the already generous legroom present, though the one downside is the footrest, which, if you're on the shorter side, you may prefer. As for me, most of you who've been here for a while will know I cannot stand them. The tray tables on all teeth generous legroom present. So the one downside Come on, there's got to be more than which, two people if you're on watching. On both sides, but the right one also responsible for managing the electronic recline function, as indicated by the two arrows. This is a huge help with adjusting the already generous legroom present. So the one downside is the footrest, which, if you're on the shorter side, you may prefer. As for me, most of you who've been here for a while will know I cannot stand them. I think they're all right. The tray tables on all TGVs have to be the largest I've ever seen on a train. Perfect for a laptop if you want to get some work done or kick back and relax. There's also a small storage net above this for placing items and clothes. Nice. Though for the latter, it may be best to use the coat hangers placed next to the window. The reading light is present overhead at the solo seats. Table seats have lamps. A standard European power socket is present too, just above the personal lifter bin. And finally, there's a drawdown blind to reduce the suddenly harsh sunlight as we make our way across France. Overall, the features of the duplex are amazing, and you can tell a lot of the design has been well thought out. Yeah. Now, oh, there is a, a cafe car on board, but this is extremely popular with long queue times. A good hack is to order using the SNCF key. Design has been well thought out. Now, there is a cafe car on board, but this is extremely popular with long queue times. A good hack is to order using the SNCF Connect website. It's fairly simple to use, and whilst I do speak basic French, the language option is very useful. All you need to do is enter the number of your train, and you can order as you normally would through any online shop. If you also I have a knew car about this app. The, yeah, that's one problem with these the TGVs. The queues are nightmares at the cafe, at the buffet cars. But I might actually use this. The language option is very useful. All you need to do is enter the number of your train and you can order as you normally would through any online shop. If you also have a carte avantage discount card like I do, you can receive right, a small Jupiter, discount. They may not listen you can though. enter the number of your train and you can order as you normally would through any online shop. If you also have a carte avantage discount card like I do, you can receive a small discount on your order. Just enter the card number at the checkout and hey presto. You'll then get allocated a pickup time window, and when your time comes, you can then head over to the cafe car at your leisure and pick up your food once it's ready. This is in coach 4 or 14, depending on which duplex set you're sat in. 
I've now used this three times and it's been very useful, especially when it's incredibly busy like this. Those who pre-order their food online can pick it up from this part of the counter here. And with that, breakfast is served. Still, I sadly couldn't cheat my way out of having to stand due to how busy it was. But this was greatly made up for by the stunning views of the There's stalls. There, there should be stalls on these trains where you breakfast can sit. Breakfast is served. Still, I sadly couldn't cheat my way out of having to stand due to how busy it was. But this was greatly made up for by the stunning views of the French countryside. A quick break to say I hope you're enjoying the video so far and please do subscribe to the channel which is free and the best way to support my work. Thanks! We are now leaving the LGV Sud-Est after almost two hours of travel time and are making our way onto the LGV Ronal, the link to the LGV Mediterranean. Everything was going so got well. got some kind of bad news, what is it Jupiter? To the LGV Mediterranean. Everything was onto the LGV Ronal. The link to the We are now leaving the LGV Sud-Est after almost two hours of travel time and are making our way onto the LGV Ronal, the link to the LGV Mediterranean. Everything was going so well till... Uh-oh. As a summary, a passenger has taken ill on the train, and to evacuate them off, we are having to make an unscheduled stop at Lyon Saint Exupéry TGV station. Oh, shit. This station links the high speed line with Lyon Saint Exupéry Airport, though it's mainly served by low cost Wego trains, with one scene arriving into the station now. With the delay being indefinite, we were allowed out onto the platform for some fresh air, though, with the amount of people smoking, I can't really call the air fresh. Funnily enough, this isn't the first time this has happened to me on my travels. Back in June, my Eurostar returning from Paris was stuck at Lille Europe for almost three hours, but we weren't allowed off until midway through the second hour due to custom arrangements. As this is a domestic TGV service within Europe, this fortunately didn't apply this time. Exactly, Neon. Where we're on and Victor are. It's 10 o'clock and... The Wego departure means it's time for us to do the same. This unscheduled stop added an extra half hour onto our delay, but this was definitely an interesting way of doing so. It's 5 past 10 when we finally leave Lyon Airport. Had we been on time, we'd be 12 minutes away from our first stop of Avignon by now. But it's all part of the fun, right? I don't know. I'm trying not to. I, I just wish I knew. We'll now take the LGV Ron Alp as far as Valence, where we then join the LGV Mediterranean. Despite the delay, we quickly reach the line speed of 300 km per hour once again, as we make our way towards the south of France. Oh, don't worry, Pokemon. I don't worry about it. I took a quick walk through the train to show you standard class on the TGV duplex. This is in a 2x2 configuration with both table and airline style seats. This is comfortable enough in my opinion and is definitely a great way to travel on the TGV. Oh, and here's what the lower deck on the TGV duplex looks like. It also features a very generous space for people with reduced mobility. Though, if what possible, do you mean, all I really in limbo? It is a very generous space for people with reduced mobility. Though, if possible, I really recommend sitting on the upper deck 
for better views and a quieter ride. Sadly as well, you're rather restricted as there's no connecting vestibules between coaches on the lower deck. Waiting to exist. You're rather restricted as there's no connecting vestibules between coaches on the lower deck. Passing Valence TGV marks our entry onto the LGV Méditerranée, which is where the real fun begins. Here we not only reach the TGV duplex's top speed of 320 km per hour, but we also experience scenery that only the Mediterranean can offer. It's awesome. We now cross over the Avignon viaducts, though I sadly got the short end of the straw sitting on the right hand side as we cross the River Rhône. On the left, there are views of both the Pont d'Avignon as well as the Palais des Papes, one of the most important medieval Gothic buildings in Europe. Interesting. Crossing over the viaduct sees us finally arrive into our first stop of Avignon TGV, one of the strategic out-of-town stations that provides links to France's extensive high-speed network. A lot of passengers alighted here to connect with the TER shuttle that provides a handy link to Avignon's town centre, located around six kilometres away from here. Cool. The accessible toilet shown here on the duplex is located on the bottom deck, with standard wads mainly being on the top. I found this one to be very clean and well equipped. The facilities worked really well too, so I honestly have no complaints. I now see high-speed rail and air travel as equal. Yeah, they are very stunning, aren't they? Mr. Well, okay. Maybe the sensor on the track could have been a bit more responsive. But a very minor issue. Overall, it's a thumbs up from me. One thing I have to mention is how amazing the duplex's ride quality is. Despite the interior being very cramped, it's incredibly smooth even as we're doing 320 kilometers per hour. Okay, Rob. The distance between stage... See you later. Despite the interior being very cramped, it's incredibly smooth, even as we're doing 320 kilometers per hour. The distance between stations is now noticeably shorter. A bit further down the high-speed line, Caesars arrive into our penultimate stop of Aix-en-Provence TGV. Unlike Avignon, there is no rail link to the town centre which made the station's location a subject of controversy when the LGV Mediterranee was first built in the early 2000s. Yeah, that is interesting. What do you mean, never mind, Neon? As we come to the end of our journey, let me draw my conclusion. I can't really blame SNCF for the second delay owing to an ill passenger needing to be evacuated, and to be honest, I've really enjoyed the trip regardless of the delays. Funnily enough, my dad was amazed at the time I arrived in Marseille, despite the delays, as he would often tell me about him doing this journey in around nine hours in the 70s, long before the arrival of high-speed rail in France. Oh, my ticket price, awesome. including my cart it is montage discount... That really is awesome. ...arrival of high-speed rail in France. My ticket price, including my cart montage discount of 30%, totaled 117 euros. SNCF prices are based on demand, and as I travelled on a public holiday, it was incredibly busy, and only first class was available. Though I did recover 25% of the ticket cost due to SNCF's G30 delay repay scheme, bringing the cost down to 87 euros. First class on this route can cost as little as 60 euros without the discount card, though I do wish that SNCF had catering included with the ticket price. Anyway, the arrival into Marseille Saint Charles is 56 minutes late. Yeah, I've been to this station before when I went to Nice. On my way to Nice. I personally think this is one of the best routes to experience the TGV, and I 100% recommend it. But what did you think? Do you have a favourite TGV route? I'd be interested to hear your thoughts in the comments below. In the meantime, I hope you've enjoyed the video today, and if you did, please like and share it to aid the channel's growth, and do consider subscribing and turning on notifications for more content such as this every week. Right, I've got a few hours to kill in Marseille now, and I'm going to do it by looking around the city. So, thanks so much for watching as always, and I'll see you in the next video. Okay, so...
Now I will... Ah, shit. Now I will end tonight's stream. Gonna go for another 45 minutes, guys, while we watch... Um, regarding where, where the birth became before me. All right. Now I will... We will go for another 45 minutes, guys. Because I want to show you all a, world's, a, tr a documentary on the world's fastest train. Wheeled train, that is. Upload my Uno Dirk drawing. Oh, cool. Well, no! Train, idiots! Less than an hour. No, this isn't it. Here we are. It says 56 minutes. It says 56 minutes, but it's actually 45 minutes. There's just an extra repeated bit added on at the end. Hopefully we won't get copyright claim with this. I'll just play it for a little bit and see if it detects copyrighted content. Right. Hope you all enjoy this and hopefully it won't get copyrighted. Let's do this. Travelling at over 300 kilometers an hour, the TGV is the pride of France's high-speed rail. Wow. Now, to create the next Wanna generation of trains, engineers are planning a daring experiment. They want to build the fastest train in the world. A bullet on wheels that will travel at over 500 kilometers an hour. When it comes to big speeds, nothing on rails will come close. The TGV owes its success to four key inventions, yeah, even goes back found in a series of landmark trains. Each one carries a major technical innovation that allowed engineers to push the speed limit further and further. One by one, traveling up the scale, What's funny about we'll this reveal foggy, the incredible I mean, stories well. behind these machines. Rain can be free and the inventions that allow oh, them to go me, ever me. faster. Four ingenious leaps forward, from the first intercity railway to the fastest train on the planet. Okay, let's see if this has caused any uh, copyright detection. No, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to have, so we'll continue. Oh yes, Dan, this is the documentary where it features Sir Nigel Gresley, the locomotive. I know you saw Gresley today. In France, nothing beats the TGV. Why'd you put a football emoji in the For chat? For most journeys, the train à grande vitesse is the quickest way to travel. For engineer and train enthusiast Jem Stansfield, this machine is nothing less than revolutionary. Indeed. I've got to say I'm a fan of the TGV. I, I like the look of them. I like the kind of classic streamlining along them. You can't help. This isn't to do. This is not to do with by the time power. And you realise that through those overhead wires, they're sucking the power of maybe a small town. And you look here at all the people just sat in comfort. Suck it. They suck up the power yeah. of a small town just to wires, power them. They're sucking the power nice. of maybe a small town. And you look here at all the people. Oh, he was, oh, come on, Stan. He wasn't being that annoying. Video in your stream belonging to someone else. Oh, it has been detected. Hang on. Unhide user. Oh, he's... No, just because it, it's personal thing. Just because it's... Um... Just because he's... Um... You're being annoyed by him. That doesn't mean... I guess I'll have to be careful. Just sat in comfort chatting, yet 
traveling at 300 kilometers an hour. No one bats an eyelid. At the GGB control center in northern France, operators guide nearly 500 high-speed trains across the network. France has almost 2,000 kilometers of high-speed track, the biggest network in Europe. Oh, your mum's on a train? All right. Mm, we may not be able to watch this documentary after all if it's detected copyrighted content. But now the French are going to make it even bigger. An ambitious expansion project will triple the size of their network and extend it even further into seven European countries. It's not worth risking. Uh, maybe I'll just leave this open for a bit later. Once it, you know, goes down. Let's go back onto terminal railways for the last little bit of the stream. It's gone. Oh, it's taking too long to load. Just watch this in short bursts, maybe. They'll build new tracks, drill tunnels through mountains, and to slash journey times, they'll introduce a new, faster model of the TG. Newt, newt to you too. Actually, you know what? Instead of this documentary, let's watch another Super Labs travel video. On, uh, let's watch another Super Labs travel video. On his, uh, Talis high speed. His experience riding Talis this high is speed. Talis. The high speed His bad experience riding the Talis high speed train from Marne la Vallée to Amsterdam. And then we'll finish off this stream with another with another video on the 357 mile an hour world record world record run. Because I feel that would be the best way to end this stream with the 357 mile an hour run being shown. This is Talis. The high speed train that connects some of Western Europe's biggest cities. Today oh, I'll be riding through on. France, Belgium, and the Netherlands in Talis' most expensive premium class. With such important international routes, you'd expect this service to be top notch, but instead I was faced with one disappointment after another. Join me on this nightmare journey as I show you why not to ride Talis high speed. I've I've ridden on Talis before twice and both times it wasn't too bad. I guess this guy just got very unlucky in the past. Living the latter. Why do you put an anchor emoji in the chat, uh, Stan? Join me on this nightmare journey as I show you why not to ride Talis. Oh, it's speed. lagging again. I apologize, guys. Hello and welcome back to another video. Today I'm just outside Disneyland Resort Paris and I'm going to be catching the Talis train here from Disneyland up to Rotterdam. I'm going to be travelling in Talis Premium Class, which is their highest class offering. So, let's go. Welcome to Man le Valais in France, a high-speed station roughly 30 kilometers east of Paris. The station is probably well, it only really best seems to be provide... Super Labs Travels videos that cause the lag. I'm going to set to a lower thing, which should hopefully Getting access to the Disneyland the Resort, smoothness. which it is remarkably close to. And I really do mean close, with it being just a one minute walk from the station to the park's ticket gates. My favourite thing about this station has to be the entrance though, yeah, which seen, is carefully I've designed seen that to video of his castle. Neon. I'm sure there are better castles nearby, but I thought this was a nice touch. Anyway, let's head inside. 
Here you can find a few staple food and drink outlets, with yeah, a selection of vending better. machines too. Mandarali is a station of two halves. One of these is the RER section, which connects the station to central Paris in just over 30 minutes. My train will be departing from the TGV section of the station, which is certainly labyrinthian in nature, with stairs, escalators and bridges running all over the main hall. The concourse is often rather busy, so if you do want to get away from it all, then be sure to head up the stairs to a quieter waiting area. This also lets in a bit more light than the rather dark lower level, thanks to a glass roof. So my train today is Thales number 9963, the 16.04 to Amsterdam Central, which I'll be catching as far as Rotterdam. But what exactly is Thales anyway? The story goes back to 1996, with the launch of a new high-speed yeah, service on the Paris-Brussels-Amsterdam yeah. route. The French National Railway owned 70%, while Belgium's took 30%. In 2007, the German National Railway bought a 10% stake, quickly selling it again in 2013. Finally, in 2022, the service was merged with another international high-speed company, serving many of the same destinations, Eurostar. The Thales route map is based around the Paris to Brussels high-speed line, with most trains then continuing to Amsterdam or the west of Germany. Some trains serve Paris Charles de Gaulle Airport and Disneyland instead of the centre, and seasonally, one train continues to the south of France or the Alps. My train is already waiting, so let's head on down. I'm travelling in Thales Premium today, which normally includes lounge access. However, due to receiving a limited service, there was no lounge here. My train is departing from Platform 5 today. This is best accessed via escalator, with lifts available too. As you can see from this angle, the station really is full of intertwined stairs and bridges, so make sure to go to your platform in plenty of time. So here's my train, and doesn't it just look great in the Talis livery? I really love the dark red and metallic design. It certainly looks like a premium product. Talis operate two types of very similar train, totaling 26 units in all. This is one of their PBA fleet, which is used on routes in France, Belgium yes, and the Netherlands. They also have a fleet of PBKA trains, which can additionally operate into Germany. Personally, I prefer the angle design of the PBA units, I agree. but both fleets are capable of an impressive 300 km an hour. Yeah. We'll be taking full advantage of that speed later on in the video. For now though, I'll head to my seat. I'll be travelling in coach 31, situated at the front of the train today. Premium is in a 2 plus 1 layout, seats mostly in airline style, with a few tables throughout. I'll be sitting in seat 41, a rear-facing solo seat. Today's route will see us heading north across the Belgian border, before serving the country's capital. We'll then continue north to cross into the Netherlands, and along the high-speed line into Rotterdam. The trip is scheduled to take 2 hours and 58 minutes to cover the 459 kilometres, or about 285 miles. Not we depart Man le Valle. Disney expensive and very plea planning. Yes it is. There are far cheaper and far better alternatives to Disneyland. One of which is Fantasialand in Germany. Yeah, Disneyland is, for the prices they charge, for the prices they Disneyland charge, it's just overrated and not worth it. You're, you're far better off going to Fantasialand. A, a theme park with very similar ride offerings. Fantasialand has very similar ride offerings to Disneyland and is just as well themed. Yeah, Disneyland is yeah, um Fantasialand is was an awesome place. Way better than Disneyland. Yeah, I agree, Stan, it is overrated. Well, Dis well, di the Disneyland parks are overrated. I'm sorry, Martin, but I feel that they are. You're far better off going to Fantasialand. I described Fantasia... I still stand by my, um... 
Yeah, I know, Stan, I know. I, I, um, I just, I still stand by, by my belief. I still stand by my description of Fantasia Land being a hybrid of, I still stand by my description of Disneyland being a hybrid of, I still stand by my dis my description of Fantasia Land being a hybrid of Disneyland, Alton Towers, and Bush Gardens. That's what it felt like to me. 285 miles. We depart Manle Valley on time at 16.04 as we begin our trip. With the station sitting on a high speed line, it doesn't take long before we're able no, to start not. gathering speed. I know. This route Stan. is the LGV onto Connection. Opened in 1994 with the intention of allowing TGV services to operate between the north yeah, and no, south of France towers. while avoiding Paris. Yeah, this is the very high speed line I'm going to be travelling on for the first time on Sunday. Don't think I'll really go there. I'm not overly interested in going either. The ride offerings aren't the best. She had a raincoat. And he didn't. Oh, God. I've been to Alton Towers before in the pissing rain. It's all right, Luke. It's all right, Lucas. We're going to go for a bit longer. It's better than Old and Victor not being here at all. Yeah, I've been to Alton Towers in the pissing rain before, and it's been all right. Thankfully, the weather looks good for Port Aventura on Tuesday and Wednesday. To operate between the north and south of France while avoiding Paris. Yeah, no. I've never been on LGV interconnection between LGV Nord and LGV Sudest, but I will be on this high speed line for the first five time. Five minutes after the journey commences, we're Soon. already all avoiding Paris. Barely five minutes after the journey commences, we're already cruising along at maximum speed, 300 kilometers an hour. Love now I'm sure you want to see what made this journey so terrible, but that will have to wait for now, as we're already arriving at our first stop. Just 15 minutes away from Manle Valley is Paris Charles de Gaulle Airport. This station has I'm an sorry to hear that, Neon. From Manle Valley is Paris Charles de Gaulle Airport. This station has an interesting feature, as you can book combined flight tickets which allow a connection to Brussels or various French destinations. Oh, good, Neon. As you can book combined flight tickets which allow a connection to Brussels or various French destinations by rail. A TGV pulls in beside us, and eagle-eyed viewers may notice just how similar it looks to our Talis train. Well, this is because the Talis fleet are based on the TGV design, fitted with extra systems to allow international service. Yep, that's what I said. As we are back on the move, it's time to take a look around the interior here in Talis Premium. <coughs> Let's start off with the seats. Yeah, pretty sure. As I mentioned earlier, on. these are in a 2 plus 1 layout. I often hear a lot of praise about these seats, and I can definitely agree. Start That's with... just as valid of a reason to join the streets, seats. Lewis. Very sweet of as you. As I mentioned this. earlier, Thank these you. are in a 2 plus 1 layout. I often hear a lot of praise about these seats, and I can definitely agree. They were really well padded, which made for a comfortable journey. The white headrest was also sporting a generously padded and soft cushion. All seats have a pair of well padded adjustable armrests. As for legroom, I was honestly disappointed. Whilst it wasn't massively tight, I've been on a lot of first-class train rides with a lot more legroom. Yeah, Even second-class on some trains is better than this. Down here you can it's find a folding fun. footrest, which is always nice to have. Sadly, mine was broken. This meant it just got in the way of what is already limited legroom. On the seat in front, you can find a folding table. This was a large surface and would be a decent amount of space for working on. Attached to the seat, you can also find a small metal bar, which I presume is for holding a drink in place. There's also a strap, and I really don't know what this is for. You can put your phone in it, oh, but James. then you just won't be able to see most of your phone screen. He later found out that these straps are used for holding phone newspapers. In it, but then you just won't be able to see most of your phone screen. If you know what it's for, then please let me know in the comments. Re no. Your phone. Really? Really? Is it Stan? It looks far better on... It looks far better on... It's far better on the TGVs. It's far better on the TGVs, Stan. Space chimps. Oh my god, space chimps. Really? This is for... You can put your phone in it, 
but then you just won't be able to see most of your phone screen. If you know what it's for, then please let me know in the comments. Mounted on the wall, you can find a smaller table, which is ideal for a drink or your phone. This is also where you'll find the seat's European-style power socket. Lastly, there's meant to be a small bin in here. However, the handle to mine was completely broken, so I couldn't use it. Okay. Beside the seat is the control panel. This features the button for the individual reading light. Oh, it was 2008. Yeah, um... I don't worry, Neon. Uh, it's Stan, um... I've definitely... I've been on trains with far better leg room than that, though. I'm a great movie, I'm alright. I'm used to plain leg room, definitely. Motorised recline buttons can also be found here, though mine seems to be struggling a bit. Yeah. In fact, a fellow passenger's seat seems to be reclining all by itself. Oh dear. <laughs> by now, you may have noticed that this interior is in pretty poor condition, with numerous broken parts and generally being unclean. I definitely wouldn't have wanted to sit at this table with the flickering lamp. This was really disappointing, as the Talus brand has the potential to be so stylish. Just look at the interior of the trains. I know. Looks great. Anyway, following the poor condition of the interior, I was looking forward to my I like it. It's not really a documentary. It's anyway, a travel report. following the poor condition of the interior, I was looking forward to my complimentary meal service. This is one of the benefits for passengers travelling in premium. Sadly, there was only bad news here too, with no service provided until Brussels due to a shortage of staff. With little else to do, I decided to go for a look around the rest of the train. This is Comfort Class, which features an identical layout to Premium Class, it's just without the complimentary <laughs> service. Though I guess on this journey, Stan is a fan of the French class, Neon. Just without the complimentary service. Though I guess on this journey, there was no difference. Through here is the onboard bar, and I love the double window design and plenty of standing room that helps to make it a light and spacious area. The design under the counter which shows tourist attractions in the cities along Talis' route was a welcome touch too. Much like in Premium though, no service was provided here. Oh god, man. Oh, I could still get a look at the menu, and there was a good selection on offer, despite the prices being high, even for a train. It's also possible to buy local transport tickets for Paris, Brussels, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, Aachen and Köln here when the bar is actually open, that is. This would allow you to skip the ticket machine queue when you arrive. Oh, I don't know. I don't know, Neon, I don't know. It's shit because it's French. <laughs> At this point, we actually cross the border between France and Belgium. This is done effortlessly at our maximum speed of 300 kilometers an hour, and you- Yeah, why does a country as small as Belgium have high speed lines? but not the likes of Canada, Ireland, and uh, and Australia. Far bigger countries than Belgium. This is done effortlessly at our maximum speed of 300 kilometers an hour, and you can barely even I think, tell. Yeah, yeah, I think so, Lewis. A few minutes out of Brussels, we leave the high-speed line to join the classic route into the Belgian capital. Find what distract we pass Forst Zoet station, which is also the site of a major high-speed train depot. This caters to TGV, Talis and Eurostar trains, so it's quite the important international hub. The main station here is Brussels South, which sees a service to all of the major destinations throughout the country. What other secrets of France do you know, Stan? service to all of the major destinations throughout the country. On top of this, there are international routes to six different countries, including the night jet sleeper train to Wien and Innsbruck. Innsbruck. Despite being the country's capital, it's actually only the fifth largest city in the country by population, coming in at just 190,000 residents. Needless to say, I was looking forward to the stop here. Hopefully the onboard meal will be served soon. Oh, 
After an extended 20 minute stop in Brussels, the train is back on the move as we now head towards Antwerp and the Netherlands. The route in the centre of the capital because is Because of copyright, quite... Lewis. We now head towards Antwerp and the Netherlands. The route in the centre of the capital is actually quite interesting as you get to see many of its buildings on your way through. This is Brussels Chapel Station, one of the stations on this very busy railway. Despite this, the station only sees a single train stop per hour in the week, and no service at all on weekends. As we headed north through Belgium, I heard an announcement that I really didn't want to oh, hear. Oh no. Would find it seems that they were unable to supply a staff member for catering in Brussels, Disgrace which means I won't be getting a meal at all on this journey. However, not all was lost. Soon after this announcement, somebody came through with a special complimentary treat. A 33 centilitre bottle of water. Pathetic. Now I can't help but be disappointed with Talis here. I paid extra for the ticket that included what they described as a gourmet meal, and ended up with a very small drink. Anyway, a station soon comes by to distract me from my hunger. Fund. This is Antwerp Central. You can't quite see it here, but this is an incredible station building that is often rated as one of the yeah, best no, in the are. world. And taking just one look at the exterior, it's very easy to see why. It's not just this. The platforms here are split across three levels, with six under the incredible canopy, four found beneath the shopping area with ticket office, and finally, four through platforms at the very bottom. Well, it's just, it's just After how it is, Lois. Just accept canopy, it. Four found beneath the shopping area with ticket office. Yes, I do. And finally, um, four, yes, I do it's still not just have this. that VHS The platforms stand. here are split across three levels, with six under the incredible canopy, four found beneath the shopping area with ticket office, and finally, four through platforms at the very bottom. After a few minutes, we're on the move again, as we work our way out of the very deep tunnel through the city of Antwerp. The remainder of the trip will be on high speed line, running once again at up to 300 kilometers an hour. No, I do still have it, James. We're now in the Netherlands, the third and final country for today's trip. Whilst the border crossing is unnoticeable, the change in landscape certainly isn't. Just look at how flat it is. Yeah. With the journey nearly over, let's take a look around what else you can find in Talis Premium. Oh, no, I don't First up is the so-called Wi-Fi well. Plus, well, the special high-speed connection it. reserved for passengers in comfort. I can still access that review and download it. I just can't be bothered Let's to take know. a look around what else you can find in Talis Premium. First up is the so-called Wi-Fi Plus, the special high-speed connection reserved for passengers in comfort and premium carriages. This was easy to connect to, though the speeds weren't the best I've seen. I was certainly struggling to be positive about this Wi-Fi. Oh. All windows have sun blinds, as shown here. For luggage, there are sizeable overhead luggage racks, with luggage stacks found in the vestibules. Each carriage has at least one toilet, located by the doors. Now, fairly predictably, things were falling apart in here too. Oh, no. Luckily, there was plenty of soap in stock, and the water was working fine too. A hand dryer is also provided. Interestingly, there was a sign in here that claims Talis are doing everything they can to try and keep the toilets clean. To be honest, they've done a good job here. I call Lewis. I call Leon. Oh, by the way, the end of the carriage features this exclusive yeah, compartment, blind, containing right. four posh leather seats around a large Ooh. table. I don't know how exactly you book tickets for this area, so if you know, then please tell Definitely me in the comments. Like a conference room there. As our ride is nearly over, it's time to go through the price of today's journey. For this trip, I bought a youth ticket. This has a varying discount depending on the route, nice, but for this Sam. one, it was about 25%. How long ago was it you this saw? This has a varying discount depending on the route, but for this one, it was about 25%. This cost me 90 euros, as I booked nearly three months in advance. Whilst this is good value for money for a long distance high speed trip, I would rather have selected a cheaper fare, as my premium ticket was pretty much the same experience as the lower classes. Now to be fair to Talis here, their staff were fantastically helpful and apologetic about the poor service, and even issued a goodwill voucher of 20 euros. 
But overall, I was left feeling disappointed with my experience today. The train was in a really poor condition, and the onboard service was not in existence. No. At the time of editing, Talis has just started rolling out its January refurbished interior. Before you actually started the time my of editing, nice. Talis has just started rolling out its refurbished interior on these trains, with the bar area removed and more seats fitted. Biggest of all, a total interior redesign. Until that's complete though, I really cannot recommend Talis due to the poor quality of it all. Where possible, I'll that always try to take last alternative time I rode on it, but that was due to the 10 years ago, so I don't know. Where possible, though, I really cannot recommend Talis due to the poor quality of it all. Where possible, I'll always try to take alternative rail services. Anyway, we arrive into Rotterdam Central, three minutes ahead of schedule at 1859. Ahead of schedule? Oh. No, I've always hated Peppa Pig. As always, let me know what you thought of Talis Premium in the comments, and for a video aboard one of the unique looking trains here in the Netherlands, then click up here now. Oh, so what's your... September 2021 it was, September, late September, early October it was, Neon. When you first started. Okay, I think it's only fitting that we end this stream with the world's fastest train speed record. 575 kilometers an hour. The fastest train ever. Wheeled train ever. This was the train featured in the documentary that I was going to show you, but, but was, but couldn't. Because of copyright risk. There we are, the uh, TGV POS speed run. I don't, need, I don't know what Dave is. Yeah, Dutch train. of speed monitoring equipment on board. Yeah, this is the speed drive record I was telling you about earlier, Stan, the one that you couldn't believe actually happened. The 357 mile an hour run.
No, it wasn't. Well, it was planned. It wasn't fate. It wasn't fate, Stan. It wasn't fate. It was left in, for my belief, it was legit. Oh, have you seen this before, Stan? Uh, sorry, uh, Neon. Have you seen this before, Neon? It 
literally sounds like a jet plane, doesn't it? Due to the amount of turbulence it's created. Five. Five hundred. Hundred and seventy five kilometers an hour. Bravo, France. And to this day, this modified TGV pass remains the world's fastest wheeled train. Well, I think that was the most appropriate way to end this stream, with the world's fastest wheeled train. Fastest of all is a maglev that popped out at 603, but I really wanted to refer to wheeled high-speed trains today. We could do better, though. Uh, yeah, I reckon we could. I reckon... I reckon, I reckon we could do a, I reckon we could do a 400 mile an hour train. I reckon a 400 mile an hour train is possible now. Right, that's more. Well, this was a very, very fun stream. It was not quite as fun as I'd hoped. It, it would have been had Odd and Victor been here. I only wish Odd and Victor were here, or Charcoal. Charcoal being here in their place would have made up for it. But oh well, I, I just wish I knew why they weren't here though, at least. But oh well, still had enjoyed myself tonight. Oh cool. Oh I don't know, Lois, what do you want about? We as in Britain, I know, Stan, I know. Well... Well, yeah, regardless of Autumn Victor not being here, it was a very fun stream tonight. I had also hoped that Vic, uh, sorry, Electro would return before the stream ended, but oh well, I'm pleased that Electro still came. Oh, nothing, Lois, it'll just be another normal one. But yeah, tomorrow is going to be a very busy day for me. I'm... At lunchtime tomorrow, I'm planning on going see to see that new action film, Monkey Man. I read the plot and saw the trailer and it looked appealing to me. So yeah, tomorrow I'm so yeah, tomorrow at lunchtime I'm gonna be seeing Monkey Man. And then when I return, I'll be packing for the trip. And then guys, tomorrow I'll be doing a bonus Spyro Reignited live stream, same time as always. 6.30 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. Because obviously I won't be watching a film tonight and I'll need um, that night and, I, um, and I'll need a way to fill in the time. So I will be doing a, spy a bonus Spyro Reignited stream tomorrow on the eve of my Port Aventura trip. So I hope you're all looking forward to that. And then the very next day, I'm off to Port Aventura on my high-speed train trip. So thank you all so much for coming. Hope you're all looking forward to the Spyro stream tomorrow. Hopefully we will see Odd and Victor there. Thanks again for coming, everyone. Hope you all enjoyed yourselves. Yeah, thanks again for coming, everyone. Hope you've all enjoyed yourselves. No, I don't. No, I don't, Lewis. I already said that. Might stream tomorrow. Oh, I don't think I'll be able to join tomorrow, Stan. Because I'll still be watching the film when you at half past two tomorrow. Well, as I said, guys, they're very fun. Hope you're looking forward to the, um, to the, uh, Spyro stream tomorrow. Yeah, I hope you're looking forward to the Spyro stream Spyro Reignited stream tomorrow. And I'll also try to post a review of Monkey Man before then. No, I don't. No, I don't like any of those shows, Lewis. 
But I have shown my face, Lewis. I did a face reveal last last Saturday. But but yeah, anyway, guys, thanks again so much for watching. Hope you all enjoyed yourselves. I hope you will see Odd and Victor at tomorrow's Spyro stream. Please like, comment, share the stream with your friends. Don't forget to subscribe to me, Train Lover 16, if you haven't already. And I will see you all in... I will see you all at tomorrow's Spyro stream. Spyro Reignited stream. Goodbye, everyone.